And a very good morning to you, Grenada, and the rest of the world. Today happens to be the first day of a brand new month, March. I'm George Grant saying welcome to another edition of Sundays with George Grant. Thank you very much for being so kind to spend uh, at least a part of your Sunday morning with us. We're happy to see you. We'll be saying hi to you guys in just a wee bit. But uh, let me say, it's another gorgeous morning here in the Spice Isle. I certainly hope that uh, things are going well with not just you, but your family and friends as well, wherever you happen to be this morning. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Let's take a look at the rundown and see what we're going to get into over the next day. Uh, Two hours and 59 minutes. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you can't make it for the whole program, which you should try to do, it's going to be up there on Facebook right after it ends. And then uh, a little later on, we're also going to put it up on uh, the YouTube platform. And by the way, I did promise you, I see that we're having a heck of a lot, a lot of listeners on uh, YouTube these days. Yeah, it seems like that's where the folks are moving to YouTube and we're going to start broadcasting live on uh, YouTube very shortly. I'll let you know about that more as uh, the time draws nigh. Uh, we're also up on the GrenadaBroadcast.com website. Every, uh, every program that we do live goes up there. So for those of you who are into social media savvy, you can also check us out on, uh, on that page. All right, and let me see here, just a couple of clicks, make sure that things going fine. Yeah, we're getting out there just fine this morning. And um, let me start with an apology. You're probably hearing that funny noise. Yeah, uh, I know that you're getting the voice okay, but it's, it's very annoying to have that uh, background noise. And uh, we're still working on it. Yeah, that's, that's all I can say to you. We're still working on it, trying to bring that to a resolution. Now, into the rundown we go. Once again, only one editorial this morning, and that comes to you from the new today. Yaman. Their editorial, which was published on Friday, is captioned, the heart is not beating. Oops, bounced the mic there. The heart is not beating. So what's that all about? Well, it seems like the editor of the New Today has decided to uh, take on the National Democratic Congress with a uh, sort of critique. I'm not going to tell you anything more. Just wait a few minutes because that comes your way right after this, budget, this uh, morning's uh, presentation of The Buzz, okay? Now, we move into the features section. Got a lot this morning, I think there are five of them. First of all, we're gonna look at the coronavirus again. What is it? There's a Canadian doctor, he's a family physician by the name of Dr. Peter Lin. He's from uh, Toronto. And Dr. Lin, you know, I've, I've seen a lot. Just like you, I've been overwhelmed with talk about this coronavirus. But the one I'm going to show to you this morning is probably the simplest that I have seen. And that's why I thought, you know, hey, let me share that with you guys this morning. Let me share that with you, okay? So uh, you'll be hearing from Dr. Lin uh, after we get through with the editorial from the new today. Then, got a couple of people coming to sit in these chairs right next to me here this morning. They're going to be sharing the, a vision for agriculture vision of the National Democratic Congress. The two gentlemen are 
Adrian Thomas, who is the deputy political leader of the NDC. And uh, I don't know if they're brothers or if they're related in any way, shape, or form, but his name is Jerome Thomas. And he's the NDC's caretaker for St. Mark. Then, oh boy, this one is sad. As you look at your rundown, it says, disappointing revelations about Mount Cinnamon. Yeah. It's an interview which I did, I think it was on Friday, Friday afternoon, yeah. With a couple by the name of Franklin and Danielle Kamajan. They're both retirees. And they invested in the cinnamon, or the Mount Cinnamon uh, project and uh, they got burnt. They got burnt. And they wanted to share their story. They did. So I'm going to have a little chat. Oh, I had a little chat with them. It's about 20 minutes or so long. And I'm going to share that with you this morning. Then, my dear friends, oh yeah, Grenada is still a buzz with the loss of one of our most renowned hoteliers, Sir Royston Hopkin. He passed away, uh, he passed away a couple of days ago, well, sometime last week. And our good friend who, let me tell you, this lady's becoming one heck of a producer. Maybe she was all along and I just didn't recognize it. You are very much aware, those of you who join us uh, for Good Day Grenada during the week, you know that uh, Margaret's the person who put together that series to commemorate Black History Month. Well, I received three videos on uh, Friday. One of an aircraft bearing the body of Sir Royston doing a flyover of Grand Dance Beach and in particular the Spice Island Beach Resort. The other one was uh, um, a water salute down at the International Airport when the aircraft landed. And uh, the third one was uh, a visit, I guess his last visit, to Spice Inn. Um, the hearse carrying the body drove into the Spice Inn property and, you know, right at the front there. And, I guess they were on their way to uh, wherever the body was going to be resting until the funeral on Thursday. And when I got those three videos, I thought, hey, let me put all three of those together and uh, show them to you. And I shared that thought with Margaret. And Margaret says, you know what? Let me put together something. So let me tell you. Up until way past midnight last night, this lady was putting together this tribute that you're going to be seeing this morning. And she did a nice job. She did a nice job. It includes the video I just told you about, videos I just told you about. And also you're going to see uh, talking heads of uh, Sir Royston Hopkin. Yeah. It's very moving. Very moving. Then, my dear friends, uh, this past week we had a couple of really interesting conversations on Good Day Grenada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Thursday morning we had Mr. Alan Bezinski, that uh, retired business executive who seems to be so busy doing other stuff these days. And on Friday morning we had Mr. Brian Pitt, who's also a business executive. And uh, they spoke about some very interesting things on uh, those two editions, the Thursday and Friday morning edition, editions of Good Day Grenada. So I thought I would share those with you this morning as well. Okay, now, uh, let me take a quick look here and see who are the folks hanging out already this morning, I'm curious and always very, very anxious to get to you guys. And, uh, okay, let's see here. 
Well, well, well. He's won. Mr. Anthony the Riggs is first up this morning. And he begins by saying, God's blessings to everyone tuned in today. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, Anthony, and congratulations, sir. Yeah, man, you're in stuff now. <laughs> John Franco is there as well. Peter Bishop, uh, Penny Crowley. Uh, Penny is out there in uh, northern Quebec. And I understand she's got her daughter and uh, her grandson with her. Hey, Penny, I'm going to try and give you a call later on this afternoon. Want to talk to that grandson of yours? He's, this guy's, what, seven or eight years old? If you see him play soccer, huh? Oh, yeah. We're going to get to him in just a wee bit. Uh, well, we're not going to get to them, but I'm going to get to them after the program, okay? Good morning, Grenada Sunshine, and Margaret is also wishing everybody a happy Sunday. I uh, see one half of the Vespre couple is there this morning saying good morning. That's Bradley. Bernard Gilbert's also saying good morning. And Anthea Rello is saying uh, uh, she's off to work today. Catch up later. Well, Anthea, hey, got to make a living, don't you, girl? We're going to miss you. But thanks a lot for checking and saying hi anyway. Uh, da -da -da -da. Arthur Langine saying happy first day in March, Brother George. Well, to you too, Arthur. And he says he's looking forward to this morning show. So am I, bro. T.F. Richards is in Wisconsin on the road this morning. You got snow out there, T.F.? If you do, keep your eyes on the road and below, stay below the speed limit. Okay. Uh, Charles Norma says uh, he's there listening. Good to see you, sir. Ryan Jabon says it's 47, that's in Orlando, 47 Fahrenheit, with 71 Fahrenheit and bright sunny skies. 47 Fahrenheit with, oh, you mean a, a high of 71, okay. Uh, he says Sir Royston's sadly missed, yeah. He's been on this program a number of times. Uh, Cecil Gittens is there this morning. Claude Pudner saying good morning. Keith, hello. Well, look at who's out there. Keith Roberts, he hasn't said anything, but Keith is keeping an eye on us, making sure that uh, we remain on the air. Nesta, hello, Nesta Aberdeen. She's out there in Switzerland and sending God's blessings and wishing everybody a happy Sunday. Ronald McPhail is there. Terrence Williamson is it? Terrence, you're early this morning, boy. How come? Uh, Ronald McPhail Alexander is here as well. Eric Stone Mitchell and uh, the other Vespray, Carlene, the better half, if you will, has just joined in. So uh, those are you who are there so far this morning. As George scurries around here and does a little click. We're going to take a quick little break here, my dear friends, and then we will get down to the buzz. Hang in there. Grenada, 1795. One man with a sense of destiny. Tonight we stand our ground. Tonight we stand on the side of history. 14,000 slaves with a dream and a promise. Julian Fedor. A Heritage Theatre production, written and directed by Chris DeRiggs, 28th and 29th March, 4th and 5th April, at the Trade Centre. People was not made to live like this. It's like we have a cause. Julian Fedor, an action-packed historical drama. I see blood falling from the sky, filling up that mountain river, flowing from Belvedere Hills. I see blood. Four big nights of theater, the play the nation has been waiting to see with Sam Gilvey, Lisa Grappy James, Robert White, Dale Devine, and other top of the line acting talents. Opening Saturday, 28th March. Get your tickets now.
one more for the road. Look, I find you had a little too much to drink, you know. Let me drive. No, nah, man, I good, I good. Alcohol causes drowsiness, slow response time, distorted vision, impaired decision making, blackouts, decreased coordination. Drinking water does not make you less drunk. Never drink and drive. It takes only a second. I'm really, really sorry. Sorry? Sorry can't bring back my sister. You've been drinking. I can smell it. Why? This message is brought to you by this group of insurance companies, the Traffic Advisory Body and the Traffic Department. You know, that uh, particular, uh, that last spot you run, we ran there, the Public Service Commission about drunk driving. A lot of people have paid attention to that. Thank you very much. Now, my dear friends, let's get into uh, this week's edition of The Buzz, and we begin with a reading from the Holy Scripture. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, Lord, my God. For I said... Do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my feet slip. For I am about to fall, and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Many have become my enemies without cause. Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Those who repay my good with evil lodge accusations against me, though I seek only to do what is good. Lord, do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly to help me my Lord and my Savior. That's a reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 38, verses 15 to 22. All right, that's our open scripture on this uh, first day of March. Uh, okay, let's move on to Little Angel. Little Angel's contribution this week is captioned, COVID-19, connecting the world, and I quote, much has been said and done about the coronavirus, including rumors and misinformation, which have also surfaced. But whatever is known or unknown about corona or COVID-19, and its origin, one thing is sure. Human beings are connected one way or the other. A coronavirus outbreak served to remind the world of that connectivity which is inevitable, unavoidable, and ought to be managed carefully. Not because of the, a virus surfaced in China meant that it was only for the Chinese. Individuals who are of the opinion that the decisions and doings of the Chinese government are none of their business may have to think again because the virus outbreak has taught us otherwise. The medical fraternity everywhere is also learning and will continue to learn about the virus. Obviously, Health systems will have to be supported as much as possible in order to assist those who will fall ill. Nothing is wrong in bringing health systems up to acceptable standards and putting measures in place to, take, to make them effective. But that shouldn't take place only during a crisis. Ongoing improvements and upgrades of the health facilities, skills, and abilities of health professionals should be ongoing as long as human beings are alive. 
not when they're dying. These practices are essential for any nation and should be the priority of countries all over the world, including Grenada. But how much can be done within these systems for a virus that has no cure? There is a race to formulate a vaccine, and that race should also be supported by ordinary people, learning and practicing prevention rather than cure. Prevention may prove invaluable for small populations, such as that of Grenada, Kerry Koo, and Pity Martinique. Among other things, border protection measures, vigilance among the population, and practicing good personal hygiene are important. They should lessen any possible spread of a virus and the number of deaths which may occur. According to Janani Hashish, in an online article which was entitled, Human Connectivity, the Key to Progress, and I quote here from Mr. Hashish, unlike all other resources, human capital is inexhaustible, self-replenishing, and has the potential to meet and overcome every challenge the world faces today." Unquote. Grenadians must identify and make use of that potential, particularly now that the coronavirus continues to spread. Signed, Little Angel. Thank you. Little Angel. Let me take another peek and see uh, who else dropped in. <laughs> okay. Do, 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 do. Hang on. He's scrolling here. He's scrolling. Uh, da, 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 yeah. Hey, Carlene Vesper has finally arrived. The better half. Russell Abraham's there. John Pilgrim. Uh, Kelly Waldron. Well, hello. Anthony Charles, Lincoln Deputy, Beverly Sinclair, Karen Archibald, and Karen saying good morning, and Melvon Coutain is sending his blessings to everyone. Okay, Pilgrims, Georgie Porgy is going to take break number two this morning, and we'll come back with the editorial from the new today, right after this. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and the cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Hey, neighbor. Here's the bill I asked you to pay for me. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LED. 
They burn less energy, right? Much less. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. And Grenlec is always advising us not to open the fridge too often. That's right. And my family washes and irons in bulk. With fuel prices changing all the time, how do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. So while Grenada can't control fuel prices, I can conserve energy and save money. Grenada, energizing our Grenada. All right, folks, by the way, you heard from Little Angel just a wee bit ago, but uh, you didn't see Little Angel, did you? Little Angel, do a quick, a very quick flyby for me. There goes Little Angel. Goodbye, Little Angel. Now, my dear friends, here comes the editorial which appeared in Friday's edition of the new today. It is captioned. The heart is not beating. Boy, this one's some food for thought. About five months ago, the New Today advised the main opposition National Democratic Congress of the need to go forward on a platform of new forces, new strategies, in order to rest political power from the ruling new national party of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell. This newspaper is convinced now, more than ever, that if Congress fails to make the badly needed changes in its way of doing business, the people of Grenada, Carriacou, and Pity Martinique will never consider it as a viable alternative to the current office holders. The party held a very important convention in November and elected former education minister Franca Alexis Bernadine as its new leader and the very first woman in the country to be put at the helm of a major political party in Grenada. Congress came out of the convention and gave the impression that the party had renewed hope and was full of vigor and vitality to start the political work that was needed to be put, was needed to put it in a position to mount a serious challenge for state power. This newspaper did not share that view since a number of underachievers and underperformers were put back on the executive in key and sensitive positions. Today, the cry around the country is that the NDC heart is not beating and the party might be dead. The evidence is there to back up this claim that Congress is far from ready and is seemingly not sure of the task ahead and the strategies that are needed to unseat the incumbents in office. The party has an available space in the pages of the new today and has not been able to submit one single article for its heartbeat column in the past five years weeks. This is clear evidence that the public relations team of the Congress has not been able to deliver the goods and has failed the party. Why is it that a party that was able to attract 20,000 plus people in the last election is not able to assemble a team of writers to handle a column once a week? Can such a party hope to unseat the NNP with its well-oiled party machinery and ability to raise millions in campaign financing for a general election? The New Today knows for a fact that over the years, Prime Minister Mitchell never wrote any of the NNP perspectives for the local media, but had a battery of persons who were assigned the task. 
and they did deliver for his party. The NDC is allowing itself to disappear from the political radar in this country. The party needs to take stock and stop the rut because it, had, because it can find itself before long as the new look conservative Grenada National Party of the late Prime Minister Herbert Blaise that only came alive when elections were called and was never in a position to mount a challenge to the dominant Grenada United Labour Party of the father of our independence, the late Sir Eric Matthew Gary. The new NDC political leader, Sister Franca, needs to take stock as the honeymoon period is over and start to seriously attend to the important business of putting Congress in a position to face the serious battle that lies ahead with the NNP. The party can only face that challenge by relooking what was suggested by the new today about five months ago, and that is to look in the direction of new forces and new strategies to defeat P.M. Mitchell in the next election. The recycled members on the executive have nothing new to offer, and the past five months is proof that it is business as usual inside of the Congress. The party has not been able to engage key members of the civil society grouping in any meaningful manner. The NDC has been shying away from the real vexing and burning issues in the country. There is supposed to be a woman's arm in the party, and today, not a single statement from that group in support of the woman who made a formal complaint to the police of sexual assault from an individual operating under the armpit of the Prime Minister of the country. The former political leader of NDC, ex-Prime Minister Tillman Thomas, who is seen in some quarters as the most popular political figure in the country, is known to be a champion for the respect of our independent institutions. The current office holders have been trampling on institutions like the Public Service Commission, with a case in point being the re-emergence of Carlton Darker Frederick, the current treasurer of the NNP, to head the physical planning unit in the Ministry of Finance. And Congress is totally silent on the issue. Sister Franca, your NDC heart is not beating and needs something to get the blood to start pumping through its veins. The people are sending out signals that they are tired and weary of Dr. Mitchell and his company. But Congress is not giving the impression that it is positioning itself to grab the opportunity to embrace state power. The NDC is at a serious crossroad and failure to address the problem on hand within the next few weeks and months will once more have disastrous consequences for it. Okie dokie, that's the text of the editorial which appeared in Friday's edition of the new today. All right, so Georgie Porgy is gonna scurry back here now to, do, 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 yeah, 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 oh yeah, you guys have finally come alive, haven't you? Uh, Davini Leo says, good morning, SGG in class. Blessed Sunday morning to all from New Jersey. Hello, New Jersey. He says, my condolences, we lost uh, a tower of a man, 
Sir Royston. I recall sitting around the table on tourism matters with the likes of Unison Whiteman, former Minister of Tourism, in the period of the Grenada Revolution. Okay, thanks for that reminder, Davini. Good morning, Anthony, and good morning, uh, Wade Nimrod Phillip. Ryan Jabon says, a tennis ball with spikes on it, nasty coronavirus, is a pandemic. It just arrived in Toronto and Mexico. I don't think you're right on that, Brian. Ryan. That's been there for uh, in uh, Canada for some weeks. He says, do not underestimate it. Well, 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 look at who here. Look at who here. Look at who here. Gloria Hobbins. Uh, Gloria says, I don't mean to sound self-righteous, but I remember being taught to wash my hands when I was a toddler during the polio epidemic in the 50s. Yes, I'm that, <laughs> she says, yes, I'm that old. Come on, tell the truth, Gloria, yes. She says, she's that old. And this was taught in school. Wash before eating, after going to the bathroom, and handling, after handling money, etc., etc. I was taught the same, Gloria. She says, now, fo now folks still have to be reminded to wash your hands as if this is a new idea because of a virus. <laughs> okay, Gloria, thank you for checking in. Good morning, Francis. Um, Ernesto Jose says, I am in total support of this article because in listening to a program from Kim Jones' show, he mentioned that the NDC don't use the platform he is giving to them also. Uh, now, Margaret's first chime this morning. She's responding to Gloria talking about the washing of hands. Margaret says, sure right about that was taught about the importance of hand, waste, hand washing as a kid, both at home and at school. Yeah, we were all taught about that. That's why these hands are so white. <laughs> okay, good morning, Maria St. Bernard. Good to see you folks. Alrighty, Pilgrims, let me see here now. It's uh, 22 minutes before 10 o'clock. And uh, just about time now to start, well, we're going to run one of our features now, and then we're going to have that chat with uh, the deputy political leader of the NDC, Adrian Thomas, and his uh, caretaker for St. Mark, I think it is, okay, Jerome Thomas. But first, let's pay some bills. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and the 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our Spicer. Red Leg, energizing our Grenada. Thank you. 
calling all vehicle owners. Inspection and licensing continues. And at Hubbard's, we want you to be ready from February 16th to March 31st. Registration numbers 2,501 to 5,000 with single registration letter. Or registration numbers 251 to 500 with plural registration letters will receive 11% off new torque tires and power max batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at the Motor Department in Mongay or the Tire Bay in Grand Nance near to the building supplies. Alrighty, folks, uh, 20 minutes away from the hour and uh, some more Corona, more Corona, more Corona. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned to you earlier on, there's a gentleman, a uh, doctor in uh, Toronto, Canada, and he had, this thing has gone viral on uh, social media. He talks about the coronavirus and what it is in very, very simplistic terms. And that's what grabbed my attention. And uh, with your permission, I'd like to share that with you right now. So we need to get the facts straight. How does this virus work? How does it transmit? Where does it want to go? And let's protect ourselves. I'm Dr. Peter Lin. I'm a family physician in Toronto, Canada. The coronavirus is a family of viruses that can cause as mild things as just a common cold, all the way up to SARS or MERS, these are these bad pneumonias that we're talking about. And basically what these viruses are, they look like a tennis ball with all these spikes sticking out of it. And depending on the type of spike, it allows that virus to attach to certain places. So some viruses, they have the spike that attaches to your nose. So basically you just get a common cold. But the SARS virus and this new virus that we're talking about has the spike that allows it to attach to the cells in your lung. And when it attaches there, it puts in information to make photocopies of itself. So it uses our equipment to make more viruses. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. Most of the coronaviruses live in animals. In this particular case, it was from Wuhan. There was a fish market where they were selling live animals. And the thought is that the virus was in a live animal, then it crossed into a human. But then what we found was that people were getting sick in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of family members that were looking after them, which now meant that the virus could pass from a human to another human. Just like all viruses, it needs to reach a target, which is your lung. And it has to get there with your help. It has no feet and no wings. So therefore, it needs us to move it there. So that's why we keep saying, don't hang around sneezy people because you're gonna breathe it in. And don't touch your face because that's how the virus is gonna get in. The masks are helpful, but they're not necessary because they're leaky. The ones that you and I buy basically have pockets here, so therefore the virus can get in. What the masks really do is they stop us from touching our face. If you're sick, you tend to mask you, so therefore you're not spewing out the viruses to other people sitting around you. The true people that have the real masks are the N95, and those are sealed. These are for the doctors that may be caring uh, for the patients. So in the beginning, the coronavirus will cause kind of like flu-like symptoms or a cold. So people just get the stuffy nose, that kind of thing. But you'll understand that as soon as that virus starts manufacturing in your lung cells, you're producing all these copies of the virus, all of a sudden now you kill the lung cells. So now you can't exchange oxygen, and that's why one of the early symptoms is people get very short of breath and they tend to have a difficult time breathing and that's why they end up in hospital. So currently, unfortunately, we don't have a direct treatment for the coronavirus. So we don't have a medication that can kill it off. And so it's really supportive. So in other words, the patient can't breathe, we give them oxygen, help them to breathe. They can't drink, so therefore we give them fluids to support them. Their kidneys begin to shut down, we help them with all those things. So it's a very supportive process. This is a new virus that we've never seen before. So our immune system, our army, are having a hard time figuring out what to do. So usually what we have to do is we make something called antibodies. So these are things that can grab onto the spikes that we see on the virus and it'll get rid of the virus for you and that will actually bring you back to good health. So therefore the elderly may have a worse outcome. And of course the young children, so the babies, their immune system is not so good either, so they may not make those antibodies as well. So just remember your hands may be with virus. The virus cannot hurt you because it can't get through the skin. But the moment I do this, now I've brought the virus right to where it wants to go. So let's remember not to touch our hands to our face. 
So let's say you think that you might have been on a plane or you might have bumped into somebody that has it. What should you do? So the first thing is to contact a healthcare worker to tell them that potentially you have it. If you're feeling symptoms and you're going to go into a facility, call ahead. Okay? So whether you're calling the paramedic or whether you're calling the hospital or your doctor, just mention that you were on a flight. If you don't have any symptoms, then what we do is a little bit of a self-quarantine. In other words, we can just keep you away from other people and so you don't go into parties, don't go with your friends, don't go into public transportation. So we can contain it very easily by making sure that you do a self-confinement, so to speak, uh, for the, let's say, 7 to 14 days is the longest patient time. So after that, if you're feeling well, then you don't have anything to worry about. So we get the facts right, and we don't have to be overly worried, but we do the right things so that we don't get the virus ourselves and that we don't pass it on to others. And if we look after each other in this way, this virus will have nowhere to go. It needs us to move it, it needs us to make copies for it, and if we don't help it, then the virus will stop. So we have the power to do that right now. services from Grenada Corporate Bank, and there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Conveniently located in the Grand Anne Shopping Centre, for over 40 years, Food Fair has provided quality service at affordable prices. Now, grocery shopping is made easier and more convenient from the Food Fair web store. Hey, babe. Hey. Listen, uh, I need you to go down to Food Fair to get some groceries. Alright, no problem. Right away. Thanks, babe. What are you doing? You're supposed to be going to Food Fair to get groceries. I am. But didn't you know you can order your groceries online from the Food Fair web store? Are you serious? Of course. All you have to do is just log on to www.foodfair.gd with credit card in hand. And with an order of $100 or more, Food Fair Granite will deliver up to 3 miles away. And you don't even have to worry about your information here. Their safety measures are excellent. So hold on. You just order online and Food Fair will deliver to you? Yep. So they want to hurry up and order, man. I already did. This will be here any minute now. Enjoy easy online shopping anytime from your home or office from the Food Fair web store. Food Fair, where you can fill your baskets without emptying your pockets. Alrighty folks, it's 11 minutes uh, before the hour and I still haven't seen my guest, uh, Adrian Thomas and Jerome Thomas. They're supposed to be here talking about the way forward for agriculture. So what we're going to do, they'll probably uh, get here any minute now, but what we'll do is move ahead to our next little feature so we don't waste any time. Uh, but just let me take one quick glance here. Uh, 
Du, 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 du. Okay, uh, Jaban says, nice medical video, medical video. Oh yeah, 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 Dr. Peter Lin. You know, absolutely. Um, and now I'm sure you understand why I was saying a little while ago, hello there. Uh, that person's gonna have to wait. Um, the reason why I said that it uh, was so easy to understand, you, know, you just saw for yourself. It seems to me that there's some people who, there's some experts who try to inform and educate the people, theoretically inform and educate the people. But they're so complex, I get this feeling that deep down inside, they're more concerned about impressing you, about how much they know. And so they're shooting all this stuff out at you and it's just going right over your head. This gentleman was very, very simplistic in his way of explaining that. Now, here's a story which may be described as a retirement dream gone sour. It's a story which is becoming all too common in today's world as so-called investors fail to live up to their grandiose promises and unsuspecting persons fall victim. Before I begin running this piece, I must apologize for the quality of the video, excuse me, of the audio, which you are about to hear. We've been having a horrendous time with audio this past few days, but I guarantee you that you will be able to clearly hear the interview which I'm about to run, albeit with quite a bit of background noise. Because of the importance of this content, I felt that I really should make an effort to share this with you. Here goes. Franklin and Danielle Kamajan, they are a couple lived and worked abroad for many years, always with the dream and intention of investing in Grenada and returning home whenever the time was right. They've always kept an eye on investment opportunities and back in 2008 entered a 999-year lease agreement with Spice One Limited for a one-bedroom hacienda at Mount Cinnamon, and that's down to Grand Dance, as you know. The couple was promised that the purchase of the hacienda would give them access to other Mount Cinnamon properties and amenities, such as the Port Louis Marina, Mount Edgecombe, and all the amenities of a five-star hotel to be constructed on the beach side of that property. They were also encouraged to put their hacienda into a rental pool as they could enjoy returns of up to 5% annually on their total investment. The hacienda was put into the rental pool from the date of purchase, but the couple never enjoyed any returns from the rental. Financial statements for the period showed high maintenance costs which erased any income from the rental. The promised hotel had not been built, so the couple never enjoyed any of the amenities that were expected with that development. Folks, I'd like you to meet our two guests this evening, who I should say this morning. But let's start with you, Franklin. I understand that you and I were neighbors many, many, many moons ago when we were probably both wearing short pants. Yeah. You see the nice to that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell me, uh, when did you leave Bermuda? I left in 1969 and migrated to Canada, attended flight school, and. Um, You're a pilot? Yeah. And the rest is history. I was too. Yeah. And I went to Canada to learn. I took you up flying when I was training in Canada. <laughs> okay. Small world, small world, small world. So yes, go ahead. Yeah, and then I uh, returned to Grenada, sat there for a while, and started working for the Yacht. I worked for the Yacht for about four or five years, mm -hmm. and then migrated back to the US. 
right before UPS. Uh, the rest UPS? Is, yeah. Okay. The rest is history. What type of aircraft? I flew the Gulf Stream 1, the 727s, the DC-8, the 757s, the 767s. 767s? Yeah. He flew airplanes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he flew airplanes. <laughs> and was it after you left Grenada that you met uh, your wife? Well, we met before. Mm -hmm. I mean, we grew up in a similar circle. And actually, I think we left Grenada on the same day. She mm -hmm. went to, we both went to New York, she went to England, I went to Canada. Mm -hmm. And then uh, eventually, as uh, she could have it got together. And, um, the rest is history. Okay, and uh, let's hear a little bit about you now, uh, my friend. I um, grew up in Belmont. My mom was Mrs. Ross at Grandy Stores, and my dad was the Mr. Ross at Everybody's Stores. And Everybody's Stores? Yeah. So you didn't know my uncle, George Grant? Probably, I remember the name. Yeah. Uncle George used to manage Everybody's Stores. Yeah. My God, my yeah. God. Yeah. I was okay. always in and out of the store. Yeah. Yeah. I remember all the departments of the store and the lumber okay. yard at the back and everything. And um, I started school at a little school called Aunt Etty's on the rocks. Okay. It was sort of a day school and then I went to Mrs. Lucas School in Scotch Street. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the convent. And I stayed there till I graduated. SJC in St. George or? Mm -hmm. No, St. George. In St. George. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I graduated. And then I went to England to do nursing. Okay. Yeah, and I spent four and a half years in England, and then came back here, mm -hmm. and got married here, and we had our first kid here, and then moved to some other islands, we moved in a few other islands, and then we went to the States. Okay. Yeah. Now, I understand that while you guys were away, and we were listening to Trey that a few minutes ago, you started, you know, even back then. How many years ago was this? Uh, 69. 69. Yeah. 69. yeah. We left the Caribbean in 1980, was it? 19. So we're talking 50 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. We left Bali in 1980. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yes. I imagine, you know, <coughs> excuse me, after, yeah. after settling down in Canada and working and all that, yes. there came a time when you started thinking, hey, maybe one of these days we'll go back to Grenada. Hmm? Yeah. And started thinking about investment. Tell me about that. Stuff. Yeah, well, the the yeah. yeah, when we left um, the Caribbean, we were yeah. based, uh, based in Bali, as with me at, we resigned and we moved to uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's where we spent from 1980 to present time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess it would be in the early, early 90s, we, we decided to um, acquire some property in Maria and we started looking into buying land or building, buying a house or something like that. And it was obvious to us that if we bought a house, we probably would not be able to enjoy it because it would either be rented or it would be destroyed if it was left closed up. Yeah. So Mount Cinnamon came along with just the ideal situation for us where we can buy into a property that we can use and where we're not here to be taken care of and according to them generate some revenue. So it was, you know, the, the perfect solution to what we were looking for at the time. Tell us about the sort of deal that attracted you to Mount Cinnamon. You know, sure, it's in the proximity of Grand Dance Beach, beautiful beach and all that, but come on, it had to be more than that. Yeah. I think the, 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 um, the, the one of the, the, the seven points was the fact that not being in Grenada, not living in Grenada at the time, the place would have been taken care of. And I think that meant a lot to us. So, mm -hmm. so that was one of the attra attractions to acquire. Um, to I always liked that area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you, uh, before coming back, did you say, you know, well, okay, I have a property in Grenada now. When I go back, I'm not just going to sit on my hands. What am I going to do? Do you have any idea what you want? No airlines for you to fly for here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, contrary to, to what a lot of people think about retirement, my, con my, um, my view of retirement is if I wanted to work, I wouldn't retire. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I wish I could have that dream someday. <laughs> okay. So, 
So I tend to come back and just live and enjoy it. You know, volunteer, do whatever I can do, just to be myself occupied and just enjoy life until yeah. the great day comes. Now, so you signed this agreement with, what was the name of the company? It's not called Mount Cinnamon at the time, but it was a whole new company. Um, spice spice and fragrance. There are so many spices in the market. Um, spice one, I think. Spice, spice one. I think so. Okay. There are a lot right. of different names for them. Spice one, spice one, three. So you signed this agreement with Spice Ones. Uh, at some point, I guess you were excited by mm -hmm. that. It's a dream come true. Okay. Mm -hmm. But things started to go sour. Yeah. I would be for that part to Daniel because she was the one who, I was always on the you know, gun and she was the one who did most of the negotiations and so with them. So she would be more... The business acumen. Exactly. <laughs> so I would defer, the, defer those questions. Okay. Me. So Daniel, at what point did things start to go south? Um, it was a few years after. You know, the first year we were wondering what was happening and we paid the they had quarterly fees, which were very high, and um, we questioned it like everybody else all the time, but there was always a reason why it was high, with this maintenance, you know, payments and whatnot. And um, it went along until 2013, and we got a payment that was just astronomical, a quarterly fee, and I said, no more. It just didn't make any sense. And every year we've been told that this next year is going to be really doing well and we have so many bookings and everything. But we never realized the 5%. We never got anything back at all. So in 2013, we decided to do something that um, we stopped paying the payments. And then in 2015, we got a lawyer to deal with them. So that's four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Now, in addition to the rent you guys were supposed to be collecting, um, you had to make other promises, like access to, uh, what's it, Mount Edgecombe? You were supposed to have access to Mount Edgecombe. There was going to be Tufton Hall, which was going to be a, a spa. There's a, a six cent spa. You were supposed to have access to the marina. Um, and all of those properties have been sold off. They're no longer there. And um, at the, there was supposed to be a development on the whole hillside of more villas and pools and everything. It was a big development. And on the beach, there was supposed to be a hotel and a private club. So all of that was encompassed into what we were buying into. The hotel was never built. The club was never built. The other villas on the hill was never built. And the other properties were sold off. When you say access to these properties, were you going to be able to live there for a period of time? No, like um, Montagecombe, part of it was the owner's house, but there was, I think it was in Bukan that they turned into rooms, not only to that. Mm. But we could go up there, use the pool, stay there, you know, bring our guests there. But it's not a big deal. I mean, that's the access? Go use the pool? Well, it was a nice place and you could go up and have lunch and you could stay in the other the little um, rooms that they had. Mm -hmm. But now it's sold. It's not belonging to them anymore. Um, and what about, uh, what about Port Louis? Because as far as I know, Port Louis is essentially a marina. I know that at one time there was talk about building a really, really beautiful hotel at the site where the Santa Maria was located, mm -hmm. but that didn't materialize. Yeah, well, that didn't have anything to do with it. Well, that didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. So where were you? Uh, I, I, I don't think that um, amongst uh, Port Louis and its present condition was what we were so what we were mm -hmm. led to believe. The entire development that was taking place in that era, they were going to have condos being built, shops. clubs, shops, all of those things. Mm -hmm. That's what we are going to have access to. Okay, okay. And um, they like, they're supposed to be building a five-star hotel on the, uh, on the lower part of Mount Cinema, on the beach area. We are going to have access to all the facilities from that area. You know, there, it was, you had to see the plans, the projected plans compared to what transpired. And then you'd see well, the enormity of the difference. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and now you're left empty hand. Have you tried uh, selling off your, your property? Oh, that's a yes. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I tried before, and then a few others were saying nobody's buying. Because when they look at the books, the figures are so astronomical, um, nobody's buying them. So you're stuck with them? I'm stuck with it. All right. So now your next step was the court. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is that where it is now? Yeah. Okay. Where to from here, guys? What what alternatives do you have other than to just wait and hear what the court has to say? And what would you like to see come out of this? Well, uh, it's it's a nine hundred and ninety nine year lease. Um, as far as we're concerned, uh, part of the verbal promises when we you know we got when we signed the lease never uh, came to fruition. So. The only thing I'd like to see is that they, we cancel the lease. You know, we give them back what the property and they give us back uh -huh. what we paid for. Okay. We didn't get what the soldier Yeah, we did. didn't get what the soldier was. Exactly. I can't help but ask this question. You talk about a 999 year lease. I am no real estate guru, but I have to ask myself, why would anybody in their right minds sign a lease for 999 years? That's how all the sold. Huh? That's how they all sold? Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, the, there was, we, ha we had the intentions of buying the property. And because, uh, as we were told, because of the condominium um, laws, or the, the lack yeah, of con <laughs> condominium laws in Grenada, they could not sell a condominium. So the only alternative was to give you that extensive lease. So in effect, you own the property for your entire lifetime and probably the rest of your family's lifetime. So it's, it's, a, it's a form of ownership. That's the way I interpreted okay. it. All right. Well, I guess it's a, it's a difficult situation, and I hope it's, uh, it's going to be resolved. Any idea how long you're going to have to wait before a resolution? With the legal system in Grenada? Nine hundred and ninety-nine years. That's all that's it. It's not a shame. It's, it's sad, but yes, there are people who wait many, many, many years. We've been waiting from 2015. It's still in the court system. Do you have any idea what's happening down at uh, Mount Cinema now? Uh, one of the things that um, concerned us is that um, mm -hmm. a few months uh, or a few months ago, mm -hmm. weeks ago, months. We, there was um, a move to redefine Mount Cinema. In other words, all the property that uh, was encompassed Mount Cinema was going to be changed. And so uh, some of it was going to be taken away from our cinema, and uh, I guess some parts in the back or whatever was going to be added to it. And our concern is the parts that have been removed are the parts that are they, they are going to sell, which would it. remove some of what we bought, like access to a hotel on the beach. Oh, yeah. Because that beach front is part of the, the area that's going to be sold. Okay. No, no, I'm not 100% sure about the um, legalities or, or the actual, you know, areas that are being sold, but this mm -hmm. is from a Leland's point of view. Finally, there are people, uh, you know, looking at you now and asking themselves, boy, how do I safeguard it against getting into the kind of uh, <laughs> doom that these two did? What would you say to them? Well, what lessons are you like? Um, I would say be very careful and make sure you have very good legal counsel before going to any deals. You? Same thing. Yeah. Double up your, double up your um, counsel. Yeah. Make sure. Yeah. Lots of but fine writing. Because I think one of the issues we're facing right now is that we took everything on, on face value because we were told these things, and we didn't have the, the legal smarts to um, get it in writing. Mm -hmm. 
So now it's... There's some of it in the end. I guess some is get that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of it. I'm assuming it's going through it now. Best wishes for a mm -hmm. successful resolution to this matter. It's it's not nice. I would imagine it's very difficult for both of you. It's very stressful. Stressful. Very stressful. Yeah. 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 You still going to anchor here or no. you, yeah, yeah. you are? Yeah. Not going to let that turn you off? No. Yeah. Only sweet home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Enjoy your swims on the beach. Just yeah, stay away from the bar and the boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I've been talking with uh, Franklin and Daniel Kamajan, and uh, please, those of you who are thinking in terms of getting into any such agreement, be sure that you get professional legal advice. We'll be right back. Alrighty, folks, there you have it. Sad story, isn't it? Well. A lot, and that's not an isolated case, eh? That really isn't an isolated case. There's more of that stuff happening. All right. Well, my guests have arrived. Uh, I'm just going to let you take a, a very quick peek. Take a look. See these two gentlemen sitting down there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, Adrian Persuader Thomas on your left. And with the arms folded, Jerome Thomas. We're going to find out whether these guys are related or not, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we're going to find out in just a wee bit. And yeah, right now, let's take a quick little break, and then we'll get to them right after this. Grenada, 1795. One man with a sense of destiny. Tonight, we stand our ground. Tonight, we stand on the side of history. 14,000 slaves with a dream and a promise. Julian Fedor, a Heritage Theatre production written and directed by Chris DeWiggs, 28th and 29th March, 4th and 5th April at the Trade Centre. People was not made to live like this. It's like we have a cause. Julian Fedor, an action-packed historical drama. I see blood falling from the sky, falling up that mountain river. Flowing from Belvedere Hills. I see blood. Four big nights of theater. The play the nation has been waiting to see. With Samuel Gilvey, Lisa Grappy James, Robert White, Dale Devine, and other top-of-the-line acting talents. Opening Saturday, 28th March. Get your tickets now. I had a little too much to drink, you know. Let me drive. No, man, I good, I good. Alcohol causes drowsiness, slow response time, distorted vision, impaired decision making, blackouts, decreased coordination. Drinking water does not make you less drunk. Never drink and drive. It takes only a second. I'm really, really sorry. Sorry? Sorry, can't bring back my sister. <laughs> You've been drinking. I can smell it. Why? <laughs> this message is brought to you by this group of insurance companies, the Traffic Advisory Body and the Traffic Department. Alrighty, folks, there they are. On the left, Mr. Adrian Thomas, who is the deputy political leader of uh, the National Democratic Congress. And uh, on his left is Mr. Jerome Thomason. Like I said, we're going to find out whether or not there's any relation. 
Gentlemen, thank you very much. Adrian, you've been on the program. Have you been here before, Jerome? No, this is the first time. Okay, first time with Jerome, but first, not first not time. First time you, uh, not first time, not at all, not at all. I've been here quite a couple uh, of times. Let me start with you, uh, Adrian. Why don't you start by telling uh, viewers a little bit about Adrian Thomas? We're going to talk about the way forward for agriculture, but let's start so that, you know, people get to know you guys. Uh, well, let, first of all, let me, George, good morning, and let me say good morning to your, listen, your, your, your listening audience outside there and, mm -hmm. and, and the World Wide Web. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't get the opportunity, opportunity to tune in this morning because I was driving, okay. although the technology provides for that. But I, I'm not acquainted as yet, George. Okay. Um, good morning again. Uh, Adrian Thomas, Pasuida, um simple guy from the parish of St. David. Um, I was growing up in a place called Mount Chanquil. In the early days we refer to it as um, Child Island. Uh, close to Vincennes of the little village. Um, that's where I grew up. Um, I went to school in that particular village. I went to St. David's Catholic Secondary School. Went to, I was a teacher before I left Grenada two years after I started to teach. And I, I did some agriculture in Trinidad, came back here. Um, while I was in the Ministry of Agriculture, I pursued a degree in law and uh, my master's in employment law. Um, left the Ministry of Agriculture at that particular time, I went into the Ministry of Labor as the Deputy Labor Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Until I was hijacked from the Ministry of Labor by the National Democratic Congress in a recruitment drive mm -hmm. and asked me to be the candidate for St. David in 2013. And I then retired from the public service. As a public servant. So you are a retiree? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, and I, um, I, I went into politics and here I am today. Um, elevated to the position of the deputy um, leader of the National Democratic Congress. Uh, very prestigious position, a position as which I'm honored for and um, based on the call from the people. Um, it's not, it's not a position of uh, imposed on the people. And they have seen something in me that they think that I can make a contribution and I'm willing to contribute anything for the people as a National Democratic Congress here for the people. We are going to talk about, I hope that we have some time at the end here to talk a little bit about the political situation with the NDC, but let me get to you, Jerome, a little bit about yourself. Yes, well, first of all, I want to say good morning to all of your listening audience in Bermuda and wherever they are on the World Wide Web. They're in North America, they're in Europe, <laughs> They're not in China. Did you get it very much, George? Well, as my name is Gerald Thomas. I was born, grew up in the village in Dukin, in St. Mark's. In fact, originally from St. Mark's. Not fully residing there now, but my whole family is up there, or my business is up there. I'm, I'm part of that community still. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, my early education was in Samaritan school. And uh, from there, went to secondary school in Gov, that was secondary. Graduated there, went to GBSS, did my advanced levels. Then I ended up in the teaching, uh, as a teacher, back in Central okay. Secondary. Left there for some time, and go into the business world. And I ended up in the financial service sector where I spent a little over 30 years before I retired. But all along, I always enjoy farming. And I always feel that on my retirement, I can go back and do something to help the community where, where I come from. Mm -hmm. And. Um, here, here am I now, back uh, doing my farming in St. Mark's area, as well as in St. Jo John's area, in fact, along the whole West Coast. I am producing honey. I went into that business. I was, I joined the National Democratic Congress in 2018. Or, or, or I joined to become a candidate for 47 Max constituency. And here am I, I'm still there with the party and trying to achieve my goals and my dreams. That is to help the people of my parish. Mm -hmm. Because over the years, what I've seen is a deterioration in 
living standards, a lack of interest in their own personal development. So I'll do my best in the meantime to see what I can do to enlist the people of that community. All right. So we know a little bit about uh, both of you and gentlemen now. Let's, let's get down to the reason why you're here, agriculture. You know, <laughs> there's been a lot of debate lately about agriculture and why it has not received the sort of attention that it should. Tourism seems to be the big thing. Well, even that's dying now. Now we're talking uh, CBI. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> where all the big yeah. moolah is supposed to be coming from. Okay. Okay. But folks, look, something goes chaotic in the world. We need to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. And would you agree that agriculture should receive more attention from governing authorities than it currently is? Well, George, I'm going to tell you, the National Democratic Congress, we are convinced that, and, and we have outlined in great details um, five of the main economic economic pillars we believe that will move Grenada forward. Um, agriculture and agribusiness is, is one of the main ones that we will be looking at. And we, in, in the National Democratic Congress, we are convinced. Sometimes it's not what the society wants, you know, but what we ought to have. In order for our country to grow and in, in order for we to move forward, agriculture has to be at the top. I mean, you, you have to feed yourself. Make no bones about that. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family with nine of us. Nobody had a formal job. We survived. We went to secondary, went to primary school, we went to secondary school, and because all of us was involved in agriculture in the land. Mm -hmm. I personally, George, when I started to have my family, I, my salary could not afford me to hire a babysitter. So I assigned my salary to my, my, my mortgage and my bills and everything, and I had to survive. What I, I turned to agriculture. And I was making more than enough money to pay a babysitter to come home. When I started to study, I could not have financed myself. I couldn't go and get a loan because I was committed to my family. George, I went to vegetables production. Gave me my first degree and my master's. Agriculture is producing is vegetables. Producing vegetables. I had a few nutmeg trees. I, I even licked them away. I, I substituted that with bananas and plantains and vegetables selling to real value on all the supermarkets in town, and I financed my first degree and my master's. And I also, my children got changed to go to school. There that, is what, that, that is what, what the agriculture is about. However, in Grenada, the authorities that be really and truly do not believe in agriculture. Agriculture needs the political will. And if we don't give agriculture the political will, our country will appear to be moving, but it will not be moving anyway. Mm -hmm. And hence the reason why in the midst of all the CBI program, in the midst of all our offshore banking, in, in the midst of all the concrete projects, poverty is still present in our society. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people cannot feed themselves. And therefore, agriculture cannot be a spontaneous response because the FAO and the World Bank have some projects that is available for third world country. So we jump on the bandwagon. Agriculture has to be organized, it has to be planned, it has to be structured. We have to train our personnel. When I was in the Ministry of Agriculture and Pest Management Unit, we all came from Trinidad and we were trained. We were properly trained and ready to execute. Today, with due respect, we don't see the importance of having trained personnel. A lot of extension officers go out to the farms and the farmers have to tell them what, is, what agriculture is all about. We are in a serious, serious, terrible position. Jerome? The agricultural sector, I mean, I am looking at it on the three headings. Let's look at the state of agriculture now. We have a total lack of interest in agriculture by young, younger people. The workforce is now aging. And God knows, by the time people like me leave that, leave agriculture, I don't know what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then, we have now a situation where climate, climate condition is affecting our agriculture. We 
have price fluctuations and we have a lot what is sad is that we have a lot of underutilized government estates and abandoned lands i mean it's sad that a country like ours yes we are small we cannot do large scale agriculture but to have so much abandoned lands and cannot be able to, to provide basic um, food for people that come from, from, from the land. It's sad. Mm -hmm. So this is the state of our of agriculture as it is now. In the past, we had a lot of productive estates. Nutmeg, cocoa, bananas, or crops that were produced in, in abundance. Yes, Ivan did give us a setback. But Ivan coupled with the lack of interest and the lack of assistance shown by this administration has really put us right at the bottom. At this stage, we depend a lot on imported stuff to to to, to go and live. And trust me, well right. We, we, we got the first warning, mm -hmm. COVID-19. See what happened to the production line in China and the rest of the world. Yes, if we do not have, if we do not, if we cannot rely on our own resources, at least partly rely on our resources, I don't know when the next one come, come along, what we will do. So we need to start, start as of yesterday to revive that sector because as I said earlier on COVID-19 is only the start of one of the many viruses that, that may be coming our way and we have to really and truly depend on our own resources. Mm -hmm. so. Judge, on, on the, the, the young people... In the Hold on a minute, uh, Adrian, before you go any further, you know somebody by the name of Tessa Barry? Yes, I do. You do that, sir. I, I saw on Thursday, um, um, I went to sympathize with the family. She lost right. the mom. She yeah. lost the mom. So yeah, I went to the funeral. I was yeah. in the funeral on Thursday. Tessa has a note here. She says, Mr. Adrian Persuaded Thomas, I applaud you on this. We need to have a series of successful life stories publicly aired to change the perception of agriculture out there. Mm -hmm. People need to hear these stories. There are many more like you out there with similar stories. Thank you very much, yeah. Anthony De Riggs, listening to you in New York right now, says, I was in a grocery in Brooklyn yesterday. A man came in and bought all the soursop leaves they had. He asked for more. I thought of the many soursop trees I saw in Grenada. <laughs> And yeah, so we, we, sometimes we cut, we trim the saw some trees and we burn the leaves yeah. into ash. It's <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> because we do not understand agriculture and what it entails and what it, the value of it, George. <laughs> now, there's a gentleman listening to you. This gentleman is a Guyanese, but he lives in a place called Ajax, just east of Toronto. His name is Clive Devers. Clive Devers. Okay. Clive Devers. Oh, Clive Devers. Devers. Yeah. Clive says, Native Indian philosophy or Grenada, huh, hold on, Grenada must instill in all Grenadians is the we the people did not inherit or land. Oh God, Clive, sorry, sorry. I'm, I don't have the time to decode that. <laughs> I'm, I'm terribly <laughs> sorry, Clive. Okay, gentlemen, listen. We have a lot of potential here, sir. Mm -hmm. Anthony just mentioned salsa. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nutmeg used yeah. to be a big thing at one time. Bananas used to be a big thing yeah. at one time. Okay. But let me ask you, what areas do you think we need to focus on? George, I'm gonna, and I like I like how you use the word used to. Because the way agriculture has been done in the past, we as we only scratch the surface. So our, your parents died and they leave five acres of nutmeg for you. You pick a basket, a bucket, and you go, you pick up nutmeg and you sell. GCNA purchases the nutmeg from you, they dry it, and they sell it in Europe. And that's where the millionaires have been generating. Mm. We need to go deeper than just producing raw material. We need to take this nutmeg, cocoa, 
those are crops we have mastered the art of producing. Mm -hmm. What we have failed to do is to go the, f the step further and process this stuff. That is what the money is. You, we, I mean, the, 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 the simple thing like the source of leaves, which is being called a miracle fruit throughout the world. People hunger for it, they need it. My brother, anything in stick and grenade is growing. Anywhere we want to go, we can go. However, you do not want to spread yourself as thin as possible, and you do not, but you need to focus on a few important crops. The nutmeg and the, and the cocoa are two crops that we have mastered the art and we can, we can build on that. People are hungry for grenade and nutmeg. We still have the best quality of nutmeg in the world. We still have the finest chocolate in the world. Recently, Honey production got an award in, in Europe, in England, mm -hmm. yes. for, the, for the finest quality of honey. We, we are not capitalizing on that. Our late brother, Dennis Well, he has started a mission. Mm -hmm. where year after year, we go to England and we, we beat them, everybody, to globally. I mean, being in government, the National Democratic Congress, George, will have to capitalize on that. That's the area you're bad in? Develop it and move with it. And we, it's not, we can sit down and identify four or five crops, but we, in National Democratic Congress, we are proposing nutmeg, cocoa, soursop, and we are also looking at some of the, the fishing industry. We export fine tuna. The world is hungry for our tuna. We have the resources. What, what we do? We hold the tuna, we cut up the head, we freeze it, and we ship it to you. And they ship it back into containers for us. Nonsense. And we, we buy it. And we buy it. <laughs> for big money. <laughs> so what we have to do as a nation is to go the extra mile. When you're thinking of too much production, George, think about from the seed to the packet of ketchup. Do not just think about the fruits. Pick it and you're going to sell it. And if you can't get sealed for it, it remains to rot. When you could grind this thing into tomato paste that every restaurant in Grenada uses. Kentucky and them, they never have enough. But they have to import it. These things are not hard to produce. My grandmother used to make shit cheese with shit, goat milk and all sorts of things. They, and this was in the kitchen. It's not in a factory. In the kitchen. A lot of small cottages are taking place in the, in the kitchen. We need to bring that to the factory. And I must add that um, the cottage industry in Grenada has gone through. I remember as a, as a, as a young man in the St. Mark's area, there was some strong and important cottage industry that was going, that, that, that was there. I remember going to the shopping, the shop, with my basket made of the bamboo. I mean, you know bamboo basket? I mean, at that, that, that time, nobody knows anything about plastic. And there were a number of small industries that could have taken off. I remember in the early time, there was the peppermint sweets that they used. Mm -hmm. That used to be made there. None of these industries take off because they were neglected. And for us to grow as a nation, the cottage industry must be developed because the private sector plays an important part. The self employed, that kind of sector, the important part in the GDP of this country. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of big companies that employ a couple of hundred people, yes. But the strength of an economy lies mm -hmm. in the in, in a powerful and successful cottage industry. And that to me is what I, I see could take the radar out from, from where it is now. Or help to take the radar out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me share some more comments sure. with you guys. Mm -hmm. T.F. Richards, T.F. lives in the States. Mm -hmm. He's all over the States. He says, George. Coco sent me and my siblings to school so I know how it feels and its importance. Okay. People out there who know. Um, Anthony the Rig says, Grenadians better plant more. If the coronavirus restricts tourism, then the value of agriculture will be seen. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Um, da -da -da -da. Roger Mitchell says, the problem with us Grenadians is the produce was never to re never to really <laughs> Goodbye. Um, T.F. Richard says, persuader, 
we first have to change our mindset. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing in Grenada, besides the economy, is to, hey, it's support. What's the matter with you guys this morning? What's the matter? Please. To, hey, it's support and appreciate local. I'm not sure what he's trying to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so we know of certain areas that could be developed. But still, it seems like, you know, the youngsters coming up today, they'd rather gravitate yeah. to a smartphone yeah. than to getting their hands in the mud. Right. Uh, and I how, did he, how did he change that, guys? Uh, that's what I wanted to raise that issue a little while ago. Because there's a, a notion that the young people are not interested in agriculture. That's not true. Yeah. That is totally false. Yeah. What we have to do, and there's no, no, nothing wrong with that. The world becomes a modernized world. We are moving at a higher level. You, we, I, I, I am not prepared. I'm, I'm prepared to leave and, and, and die and maybe die in agriculture. But I'm not prepared to cut last two, four acres of land to plant some bananas. I'm not prepared to fork at this point in time. If I have five acres of land and I want to put it under production, we need to employ modern tools in the business. We need to go in the direction of scientific agriculture. We need to develop hydroponics. We need to develop greenhouses. Quarter of an acre of land on the greenhouse or hydroponics. George can make millions of dollars in a twink of an eye. We do not need the five acres to plant because you have to face the weather and all this. The control environment could be crucial. The young people they have mastered the art of, of, of electronics. The world, is on, the world is on the internet these days. Mm -hmm. The kids could sit down and get your pro agricultural produce market for you. Marketing is crucial. Branding is crucial. When I, when I was growing up, we had planting chips in some little snow ice bags and selling peanuts in some little snow ice bags. We have planting chips in some beautiful bags coming from Costa Rica. From, from the time you hit your eyes, you want to buy one. Same planting chips, same planting. We have to market, we have to package our products. And that is where the young people can be utilized. They have the skill. If you ask them to build a, to come up with a little graph to, 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 to put your, for sell your honey Maybe, on a yeah. nice label, they will do that for you. So agriculture is not just cutlassing bush and forking land and planting and selling. It's cool. That's why I say from the seed to the package. And the young people will enjoy that aspect of, of agriculture. We have, to, we, we have to modernize the industry if we want the young people to be part and parcel of the whole project. And when, when do we start? We have to start in the schools. And we have to start, at a, start with the schools by teaching young, at, at a very young age. What I would like to see is that every primary school has a greenhouse where they can introduce farming to the young ones. Scientific farming. Scientific farming. We're talking about, as he mentioned, hydro hydroponics. Mm -hmm. We're talking ab about um, ab about composting. We're talking about how to use drip irrigation to conserve water because as water is getting getting more and more scarce. All this. If we instill those values at a young age, I'm sure in the years to come, the benefits will be achieved. We cannot do it with the form fives or people above that at that stage you now. We will try. Some will be successful. But to really make an effect, we have to start right at the bottom of the primary school level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's also a crucial point, John. Persuader, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. Somebody named Silvani, Silvani Noel says, very good, Persuader, in response to what you were saying a little while, mm -hmm. while ago. Anyhow, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to make the point on, on, on the question of the, some of the challenges that we face. Um, one of the mistakes, I personally believe, not my party position, that the governments have been making with the farm roads over the years is spending, is, is spending millions of dollars on these concrete roads. And many, many places that the government has built farm roads, owners of land, turn this land into real estate and build up communities where we could put it under concrete. I believe, going back to the estates, estates is just a concrete road to move about. 
what they have is a well-drilled road where they put gravels or teeth or whatever it is and they maintain it. Now, imagine if you build these teeth roads with gravel and so on and your proper, the maintenance crew will be walking through the year. Number one. Secondly, the amount of money you're using for this concrete, you can help the farmers with the infrastructure on his farm. More greenhouses, more sands, more funds. Judge, the money is there for agriculture. We may need to put a little more on it, but it's prudent management it calls for. We cannot afford to be put building miles of road with concrete, and you drive these roads, and people hardly farming because they do not have the initial capital to develop the farms. Mm -hmm. And that is what we need. So you build the roads, and the farmers catching the hill. They have no access to financial financial institutions. They don't have the initial capital, and so they cannot make a start. Well, listen to what some of the people out there are saying. First of all. George Peters says, George, can you ask Adrian, what is the difference in the contents of first grade mace and third grade mace? Is it in the looks? Is it the looks that set the price? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I mean, <laughs> that's the, uh, well, the quality in term, I mean, if you have a, a, an apple that is, that is, that has an infection, it's, it's a less, of less quality. Mm -hmm. the, the first, the number one mace is the, mass, is the mace with no blemishes. Pretty red, you can use it right away. Right. Number two mace have less of that quality, and the number three is just, is grand grand pieces of mace with a lot of blemishes and so on that you'll have to just maybe grind and ground and before you could use it. All right, the so fresh you, mace you could use it one time, number one. So you're taking care of Mr. Peters. Davini Leo says, we've been talking year after year about our agricultural sector. There are plans, I'm sure, in the ministry for Grenada's development. Can we get some investors in that area? The present administration is not interested in agriculture. Nah, we're interested in hotels. Hotels, CBI, quick fix, but it will not take us anyway. <laughs> Anthony the Riggs is asking, anyone remembers the kitchen garden? Big time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and folks, I'm just reading these for the first time, eh? Sure. Um, J.B. Johnson says, Blessings, brothers. We need to bring back Nature Corner in the schools. Mm -hmm. That's where it started. That's where I started. <laughs> um, Rajban says, My auntie sold my kitchen garden produce for me in Grenville, the Grenville Market. Um, I attended McDonald College. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Melvon Coutain says, I already start doing that. Come to Woburn Schools, see what the Olive Branch Project uh, is doing. Are you familiar Olive with that? Olive Branch Project. Yeah, Melvon Coutain, I mm -hmm. think he's a martial arts instructor. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he works a lot with kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hold on, hold on, hold on. T.F. Richard says, I went to a doctor's office. I believe out, out, I give up, I give up. I <laughs> so if I got some things. <laughs> I, you know, I, I try so hard to make sure everybody gets in, yes. but sometimes these people just don't think before yeah. they talk. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try again. I went to a doctor's office. I believe out our not she had vegetable growing in a climate controlled machine resembling that of an incubator. Mm. So this goes to show or forward the idea of technology. Do, do you get that? Yes, I got it. Yeah, I get this. Yeah, okay. I get this story. <laughs> um, guys, let me tell you what, eh? Um, I had promised that we could also touch a little bit about on a little bit about the NDC, mm -hmm. okay? But I am really stressed for time here this morning. So I can understand yes. that. <laughs> how, how about asking you guys to come back? How soon can you come back? And I am at your disposal. Just give me a couple uh, week notice and I will prepare myself. If I ask you to come back next week, could you? Next week, Sunday, the 8th of, that will be the 8th. Yeah. I'm heading to St. Patrick's for the entire day. We're supposed to have an international women's okay. day rally up there. Call me uh, and the first available Sunday. Yes. Well, let me know. Uh, yeah. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about the sure, party. Sure, we can okay. do that. We can I do that. don't know if you heard the uh, editorial this morning that was aired uh, about the uh, NDC. And I really want us to chat a bit about that. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. maybe you could, you know.
mm -hmm. arrange a little tete-a-tete -tete for us. No problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. All right, I've been talking with the uh, deputy political leader of the National Democratic Congress, Adrian Persuader Thomas, and no relation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr. Jerome Thomas, who is the uh, caretaker for St. Mark's, okay? St. Mark. St. Mark. All right. <laughs> Folks, let's take a little break, and then we'll come back with that tribute, Koi, the tribute that Mags put together last night to uh, Sir Royston Hopkins. You don't want to miss that. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and the 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Hey, Lynn. Hey, neighbor. Here's the bill I asked you to pay for me. How did you get your electricity bill to be so low? For one, we size our transformers just for what we need. And we unplug transformers, chargers, and other devices when they're not in use. We also replaced our light bulbs with LEDs. They burn less energy, right? Much less. I even replaced the seal on my refrigerator door to keep the cold air in. And Green Lake is always advising us not to open the fridge too often. That's right. And my family washes and irons in bulk. With fuel prices changing all the time, how do you know if it is working? We pay attention to the usage history table. Over time, our average usage has decreased. So while Grenada can't control fuel prices, I can conserve energy and save money. Green Lake. Energizing our Grenada. Alrighty, folks, it's now 12 minutes away from the hour. Still have a lot of stuff to come in the next hour, 12 minutes or so. Doubt whether we're going to make it, but let's give it a shot. Now, as just about everybody in this country knows, Sir Royston Hopkin, hotelier, editor of the Spice Island uh, Beach Resort, passed away at, uh, last week following heart surgery. Well, let me tell you. A private aircraft, and before that aircraft landed, uh, arrangements were obviously made for an overfly of uh, the Grand Dance Beach, and in particular, the Spice Inn, uh, where a lot of the staff gathered on the beach, you know, to wave that airplane. You'll see that in just a wee bit as it flew over. When the airplane landed at uh, the Maurice Bishop and National Airport, it was greeted by a water salute. Two fire engines on either side of the taxiway into uh, the tarmac were there with their hoses spraying water. And then the body was taken from there to uh, wherever uh, with a quick visit to the Spice Island Resort on the way. Boy, let me tell you, she busted her chops last night. Actually, since yesterday afternoon, she started working on this. 
Margaret was good enough to put together the video that you're about to see. Um, and she tells a very impressive story about Sir Royston. You learn a little bit more about this gentleman and why it is he's so uh, gravely missed by uh, a lot of people. Sir Royston, farewell, sir. With a final flyover, Grenada solemnly welcomed home the body of beloved, honored, and respected hotelier Sir Royston Hopkins. Moments later, sirens heralded the final drive past his beloved Spice Island Beach Resort amidst sounds of grief as Grenadians prepared for the final goodbye. So Royston Hopkin, owner and chairman of the award-winning Spice Island Beach Resort in Grenada, died following complications from heart surgery. Sir Royston was one of the Caribbean's most successful and accomplished hoteliers who was known for his work and contributions to tourism development in Grenada and throughout the Caribbean. His storied career began at age 18 after dropping out of the Grenada Boys Secondary School work at his parents guest house well I've been in the business for over 26 years just about 26 years um, I started off working with my parents at the Ross Point Inn and eventually get branched out on my own a few years later and I now own the Spice Island Inn on Grand Dance Beach and the Blue Horizons Cottage Hotel from 28 Sir Royston nurtured and elevated the Spice Island Beach Resort into a 64-room, six-star luxury resort that has become synonymous with elegant luxury. Its famous clientele have included U.S. presidents and British royalty. Sir Royston credited his success to a dedication to excellence and a commitment to exceeding the guest experience. So therefore, we just try to execute our expectations. We have to have a sense of excellence. We have to know that we are people and we are not in the market. We have to have the expectations that we are getting. That commitment to excellence led to Sir Royston being the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the coveted Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association Hotelier of the Year, the Grenada Board of Tourism Nutmeg Award, Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, and the Star Diamond Award from the American Academy of Hospitality Sciences. In 2004, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for his contributions to the Caribbean and Grenada's tourism, becoming the only Caribbean hotelier to receive this honor. Sir Royston was well known for his philanthropy especially in the area of education. You don't empower yourselves with a good education. Your chances of getting by are very, very slim if you do not have a sound education. True to his belief, Sir Royston established the Sir Royston Hopkins Scholarship Award, which has awarded more than 200 scholarships to students in financial need. Over his career, Sir Royston served as president of the Grenada Hotel and Tourism Association, president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, and chairman of the Caribbean Alliance for Sustainable Tourism. He is survived by his wife, Lady Betty Hopkins, and three children. For Sir Royston, it was a wonderful journey that has left his beloved Spice Island Beach Resort well placed for the future. It has been a wonderful journey. Um, today we now have um, 64 suites, 
um, we sit on 1600 feet of beach and we are well placed as one of the major or better boutique resorts on planet Earth. That was nicely done. Uh, before I go any further, let me uh, say thank you to a number of uh, sources. First of all, Green Globe for use of their, their video in that piece there. Uh, also the Grenada Broadcasting Network, uh, Gentle Ben, and of course a very, very huge thank you to you too, Margaret, for your time, your effort, and your creativity. Really do appreciate that. There's a comment here from, uh, uh, oh, where is that, where is that, where is that? Oh my gosh. Are you guys having internet problems out there as well this morning? Um, I noticed that some of the stuff is uh, kind of freezing up. Uh, the replays that I'm seeing here are really freezing up. But as far as I recall, there's a note there from Clive. Clive is out there in Ajax. And he says his wife, Jackie, was uh, really moved uh, when she saw, uh, hold on a sec here. He says, Jacqueline was so touched when we watched the video. May Sir Royston's soul rest in peace. Yeah, yeah, Clive. My regards to both you and dear Jackie. Ryan Jabon says he is back home. Gone, but never forgotten. We love you, Sir Royston. Had a nice dinner with an American family friend uh, as a secondary schoolboy at the Spice Island Inn. Um, and he's also saying, Mags, well done. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, folks, it's uh, coming up on four minutes, uh, three and a half minutes, actually, before 11 o'clock now. Um, for those of you who join us on Good Day Grenada, you know that on Thursdays we have Alan Bajinski and on Fridays we have Brian Pitt. They join us for a little tete-a-tete -tete on those two days. And yeah, they, they take on serious issues, you know, whatever they have to get off their chest, they do. They do. No holes barred. And so, while they're dealing with serious stuff, you should never be surprised if you have something that will, you hear something that will just make you crack up laughing. And that happened in the next two pieces that you're about to see. Let us take a look in just a wee bit. I'm going to take a little break here, but then we'll take a look first at uh, Alan on Thursday. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and the cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates. 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and the 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Together with you, our customers, we energize our community. Together with you, we energize our economy. We are working together to give our nation a better tomorrow. With you, we energize our future. Together, we energize our nation. Thank you for partnering with us as we energize our Spicer. Red Leg, energizing our Grenada. Calling all vehicle owners, inspection and licensing continues and at Hubbard's we want you to be ready. From February 16th to March 31st, registration numbers 2,501 to 5,000 with single registration letter or registration numbers 251 to 500 with plural registration letters will receive 11% off new torque tires and power bags batteries. Don't get caught unprepared. Visit us today at the Motor Department in Mongay or the Tire Bay in Grand Dance near to the building supplies. Now, folks, I want you to remember that uh, the next two pieces you're going to see were pre-recorded. These guys aren't in here today, okay? Pre-recorded, so please don't ask any questions. 
your comments would be greatly appreciated. But they can't answer you if you're going to be asking questions. First of all, my dear friends, Alan Bajinski, last Thursday morning. Good morning, Mr. Bajinski. Good morning. How are you, sir? I am fine. I'm getting a little static in the yeah, background. Yeah, there's, uh, there's something that's been annoying us a little bit for the past few days. Uh, we're working on it. Good to see you, sir. Uh, I'm a little bit curious. The black t-shirt, but I'm not able to see what's on there this morning. I you know you usually have something pretty thingy. Who that, sir? That is the late chairman Mao Zedong. Pardon me? The late chairman Mao Zedong of China. Any message there that we should pay attention to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm expressing solidarity with the students in China who are in lockdown. They can't leave. Okay, first, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I'm going to ask you what's up your sleeve this morning. Um, having brought in China, um, which seems to be top of everybody's mind, I was looking at the buffoon who occupies the office of president in the United, in the disunited states, on his return from. Uh, India and um, he seemed to have some dissonance with regard to what is going to happen in the United States and how are they going to deal with it because at the same time that he was saying that uh, they have everything under control and uh, they have the best people and the best facilities. Everything is the best as usual. In Sacramento, California, they have determined that there is the first confirmed case of COVID-19 where they cannot trace any contact between the patient and any other person. So this has so far been referred to as community transmission because they can't say who is the person. So the buffoon has been accused of either having been in possession of this information and deliberately trying to mislead his audience or perhaps it is incomprehensible to him, given the fact that he has spent the last three years making America great again. And they seem to be incapable of coordinating a response. Now, with regard to the coordination of a response, it would appear that the Chinese authorities, several weeks ago, locked down the entire province around the city of Wuhan, which is the epicenter of this outbreak. I believe some 60 million people are essentially quarantined. More importantly, air travel out of China, sorry, out of that particular district, I believe I'm correct in saying, has been eliminated. In other words, they have decided that those individuals who are in the region will stay in the region until this virus works itself through the population there. There is perhaps information that ought to be shared with the public. But the Chinese Communist Party being what it is, and the President of China for life being who he is, the information that may well have been available since December only started surfacing towards the latter part of January. So that 
work or responses that ought to have been undertaken maybe two to three weeks earlier were delayed. Naturally, the Chinese response was to dismiss, discipline, rehabilitate officials in the general area. But how does that help us here? You see, the absence of information regarding whether or not non-nationals who are present in the province can leave seems not to be very clear. Now we know that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here has a direct link with the ambassador in China. There is a family relationship, the last I heard. We have also heard that the respective ministries, whether it is education, foreign affairs, or whoever, claim to have been in touch with the Grenadian nationals, some 14 of them, I believe, so that they are supported. So it's a little unnerving that we have seen circulating on WhatsApp a request to sign a petition put out by these students, or at least one of them. Um, when last I looked, they were trying to get 1,500 signatures, and when last I looked, they had just got about 1,121. So uh, clearly they're getting a rapid response. But my question remains, what is the purpose or what is the point of asking for repatriation if the Chinese authorities have determined that no one will move out of that region? Apart from which I think it's fairly clear that even if a plane is sent, unless there's a direct flight from Wuhan to Point Salim, I don't know of any international airport where the plane will be allowed to transit. But again, I hasten to say, I don't know. Why do I not know? Because there is not enough information which is forthcoming from either the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of National Security because trust me, this will soon become a national security issue. Apart from that, the issue of trust comes to the fore. Do you believe as a citizen what you are told by our government? They, I started off by saying that the buffoon who occupies the office of President of the United States made statements which are unsupported by the facts because his own head of the Department of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, had to hasten to say that he remains chairman of the response team in spite of the fact that Trump announced that he's putting his Vice President Pence in charge. Now, there is clearly a credibility issue there. There is clearly an issue of trust. And so I ask the question again. Faced with any situation where you have a credible organization with a track record of providing information which is verifiable and listening to platitudes being put out by the government, who, whom are you likely to trust? So I will conclude by saying that while Renlex shareholders have been written to by the chairman of the board of directors with regard to certain issues concerning Renlex and the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, I know of a well-placed individual who, in response to the question put to him, 
as to whether or not he was aware of these issues of concern. He claimed not only to be ignorant of what the PURC had put out, but questioned whether or not what the position communicated by Grenlet could be considered to be honest. Well, my response to that high-placed individual is very simple. Given a choice between believing what Grenleck says and what the government says, my choice is clear. And I don't. All right. Mr. B, Mr. B, always so succinct. You got it. Mr. B, I've been listening to you, before we get to Grenlick, I've been listening to you here on the coronavirus. And you know, uh, the scary thing uh, I discovered in listening to you is that we just don't know who to trust. And that, sir, is very scary. I mean, we're hearing, not only is do we believe that information is being withheld from us here by our authorities, but we're also hearing conflicting stories. Now, you just raised the issue of Donald Trump. Again, Donald Trump, um, I mean, I, I don't think he's any position to usurp the health authorities in the United States. So many different stories, and I'm sure that you've seen them on the internet. But who? Who do you believe, sir? Is this thing going to be a global pandemic? I, I heard a, a, a preacher on television yesterday advising people to stock up on food supplies for the next six months, sir. Alan, 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 who do we believe? I don't believe preachers because I believe in science. And in the science, as of February the 26th, yesterday, in the United States, there have been 59 confirmed cases of COVID-19. All of those involved who either have traveled to Asia or who had close contact with them, did, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. However, the CDC announced that the eventual spread of coronavirus among U.S. communities is nearly certain and while it is unclear how severe the spread will be in the united in the disunited states americans should be ready for a significant disruption to their daily lives for example just today in japan the prime minister has announced that there is likely to be a shutdown of public schools for four weeks but to get back to the states traveling within the United States so far is not, con is not deemed to, to be of concern. How about air travel? It is the, the experts say traveling on airplanes and in airports should be safe because unlike chicken pox or measles, the virus doesn't appear to be airborne, meaning it most likely does not linger suspend the air. So what this means is walking around with a face mask is of no use, no purpose, unless you yourself are already infected, so that in the event that you sneeze or cough, then the face mask will keep the droplets on you. In the event you don't have a face mask and you cough, you ought to try to cough into your elbow, as we have heard, rather than onto your hands. And you need to keep washing surfaces with which other people may have been in contact. They say it's probably a good idea to use wipes to clean tray tables, bathroom handles, and other parts of a plane or a train or a car, a bus that you might have been on. Alcohol wipes have not been proven to prevent coronavirus, but they might help minimize exposure to infectious organisms. So, what you see coming through is don't panic, remain calm. 
and so while it is likely that it is it will spread just remember there are 300 and what 70 million people in the continental united states i believe but 59 cases so far sure it's going to spread but is there likely to be a pandemic the who has resisted stating that it will be a pandemic global spread um influenza in the old days killed more people in 1918 between 1918 to 1921 more people died of influenza i think it was called the spanish flu at that time than died in the first world war in the four years of the first world war so we have learned a lot since then with regard to isolation quarantine and so forth so the idea is that there must be a coordinated response based on science that preacher who says stock up for six months is he going to stop accepting tithes so that his congregation will be able to buy supplies for six months is he invested in the stock market in companies which he thinks provide those supplies so i would suggest Stick with the science and leave the preacher to preach. All right, but but Amy, uh, as far as that preacher is concerned, what what they were actually doing on the program is selling these uh, packages of uh, pre-prepared food. So seriously, anywhere from I think uh, from one hundred and fifty dollars for a couple of days supply up to three thousand dollars. Okay, now let's forget about the preacher for just a minute, Alan. You still have me a little bit confused because it, it seems like we're still hearing conflicting stories. Now, yesterday I heard a story that said that in summer, you know, with, with the temperatures rising in summer, you should have absolutely no fear of the coronavirus because the heat kills that virus. And the person that sounds, who that was, sounds uh, like a Trump rumor. was a very accomplished uh, health expert in Canada, and he said, if that was the truth, then how come Singapore, where uh, right now it's 30 degrees Celsius, that's about 86 Fahrenheit, they have a major issue? That's just one of the stories, A.B. So. Who? So who? so why who? why you why are you listening? You're saying you go with science. I'm saying yep. even the scientific stories are conflicting, Alan. Hold on a second. The coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, is just a variation on the common cold, as you may have heard. Alan, there are well, people who are the common Alan, cold. Alan, this Alan, Alan Alan, there are people who argue that. That's fine. Because they can argue because they don't know the science behind it. So, I will stick with going to the website of the World Health Organization. They have been issuing daily updates about the spread of the coronavirus. And at the end of the day, remember that 81,000 people have reportedly been infected of which less than 3,000 have died, nearly all of whom were in China. So as it spreads, there will be more deaths outside of China, but do not panic. Now, stick with the WHO and see what they are recommending and see what responses are being communicated by your local health authority. I do not believe that telling or, or making statements to the effect that we are prepared for anything, I don't believe that makes any sense. 
It's as simple as the people who are panic buying face masks. The face masks are of no use to you because it is not an airborne transmission. You must actually come into contact with the droplets from coughing or sneezing from an infected person. So the face mask, as I said earlier, is recommended if you are already confirmed to be affected and you're coughing and sneezing and you for whatever reason there might be people close to you. I rather suspect that as soon as you start to cough and sneeze, everybody's going to run away from you. They're not going to be close. All right. Alan, we have so far neglected uh, the folks out there in social media, so just bear with me for a couple of minutes while I uh, share some of their comments with you. Margaret Francis says, Alan, the Chinese have since admitted that they made a mistake in not being open with the information from the onset. T.F. Richard says, Mr. B, do we ever get any or enough information regarding purported issues by this government? He also goes on to say, the button has put a dummy in charge of the virus. What a laugh. Says Mr. B, is the guy in Grenada from the family lineup or descendants of the buffoon? Uh, TF, you're, you're losing this, TF, you're really losing this. He says, Hey, George, remember the famous statement, you can't bite the hand that's feeding you. We can't expect the government to say anything adverse for fear of unpleasant retaliation from the feeder. Margaret Francis says, another thing, I get the emotional and scared reaction that will make individuals want to bring the students home. But consider this, as of now, Grenada does not have the virus. Doesn't bringing people from an infected area raise the risk of bringing the virus to Grenada? Good point, Max. How do we know? that one or more of these students are not already affected. Bear in mind that someone can be a carrier of the virus and never become ill. TF responds to her by saying, and Mags, you know at this stage, it's likely that unless the students speak for themselves, we may never know if anyone is affected or infected. Uh, Maria St. Bernard says, the news in Canada reported that a traveler returning from Iran contracted the COVID-19 and her husband has now been tested positive for the virus. Ooh, yes. uh, Margaret also says, I'm with Alan on this. Stick with the science. Okay, next. Um, Michelle says, thanks for bringing a sense of calm to the situation. We must be cautious, but panic is not necessary, nor is it helpful. More than likely, it will come to our parts. We live in a global village, but until it does, we do not need to make foolish statements. Absolutely, Michelle. And finally, Anthony Drake says, someone in California got the coronavirus from, quote, unknown origin, unquote. And the authorities are puzzled. Maybe you hear what the people say. What say you? Lost you there. Frozen. Lost your audio. I wonder why. Are you here? You hearing me now? Okay. 
So yes, you heard the comments made by uh, the people in social media. What say you? Um, yeah, it's uh, likely that it will eventually move via the United States to here. Um, but we need to consider that the, it, is, it is the spread of uninformed comment that is likely to do more damage than anything else. Right now, experts say the fatality rate remains under 3%. It is only in Iran that they have had uh, a, a larger death toll. Um, why Iran? I, I, I don't know. Um, except that their government is perhaps less likely to admit anything than the Chinese. So we'll, we'll have to we'll have to make sure that um, we don't have any contact. Not that I'm aware that we have any. Ah, let me rephrase that. Since it has become a matter of national security as to whom we are selling passports to, then we need to be careful as to whether or not Iranian are not going to be rushing us for passports now. And it, for the life of me, I don't understand why we have accepted this ridiculous assertion by our government that they can't publish the names of the individuals who have been issued with passports for security reasons. I think that is, that is the height of nonsense, really. We need to know who the citizens are. There's a lot of things we need to know and still don't, but let me uh, digress here for a minute. You said that the 3% fatality rate doesn't really concern you. What percentage does it have to get to before you start seeing red flags? I would suppose 5% or more, because so far, um, this is less than the fatality rate we had with SARS. Remember, remember when we had SARS? And um, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that one was MERS or MERS or whatever. Um, but we had those uh, 18 years ago, something like that. So it's less deadly. But again, remember, you have lies, damn lies, and statistics, as usual, because we don't know um, where, the, where the fatalities have been concentrated. Um, I was, we were under the impression originally that there were three categories most at risk. The very young, the elderly, and those with compromised immune systems. Now I am seeing data which suggests that children are not as susceptible as was initially thought. So it is the elderly and uh, people with compromised immune systems. My question then remains, what constitutes elderly? It could be you, it could be me. Mr. B, uh, thanks for going in that uh, direction. I, I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, just let me see if I can pull this up here. Last night, I published on the GrenadaBroadcast.com website a story which is captioned, Visualizing the Coronavirus Outbreak. It says here that researchers at John Hopkins University have created an interactive dashboard to track the spread of a coronavirus outbreak in real time. Hear me? Updated every 15 minutes, the dashboard maps cases, deaths, and recoveries at the province level in China, the city level in the United States, Australia and Canada, and country level otherwise. 
The dashboard is designed for researchers, public health authorities, and the general public to easily track the virus's spread, its geography, and its lethality. Alan, if you go to my site, you will see that. If you click on the link, a graph comes out. It's a map of the world, and it shows you where the cases are, uh, the places where and how many people have recovered, and how many people have died. Check it out. Put out by John Hopkins University. Actually, the name of Hold on a sec here. Hold on a sec here. It's put out by Open Source Policy Center, and it's based on uh, data from the John Hopkins University. Check it out, sir. Okay, um, and you can also look at the WHO um, site where they give daily updates um, with regard to risk assessment and the situation in numbers. So for example, in China, there have been 2,718 uh, deaths out of China. There have been 44 deaths. So it's, it's concentrated in China, and the Communist Party is making sure that they will remain on lockdown in that province of Hubei or wherever it is, where the city of Wuhan is. Lots of information out there, Mr. Bashinsky. And on that note, I say thank you very much for your Thursday morning sojourn. Appreciate it. You have a good day and a great weekend. And, and just let me say again, recommendations and advice for the public. If you are not in an area where COVID-19 is spreading or if you have not traveled from one of those areas or not been in close contact with someone who has, your chances of getting it are currently low. However, it's understandable that you may feel stressed and anxious about the situation. It's a good idea to get the facts to help you accurately determine your risk so that you can take reasonable precautions. So what we want is for our Ministry of Health to provide us facts and with regard to the petition, um, let the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ambassador, the Grenadian Ambassador in China get in touch or get in closer touch with the, the people behind the petition to ensure that their fears are allayed. And they need to know whether or not what they're asking for is in fact feasible with regard to the possibility of exiting the quarantine area in Hubei province or flying from China to Grenada. Remember, in spite of the rumors regarding two recent flights containing plane loads of Chinese. Um, while the origin of the flights clearly was not China, nobody has yet satisfactorily indicated as to whether the Chinese nationals on those private charter flights had been in China within the last 21 days or so. We don't know. And we ought to be informed Okay, A.B., and as far as providing information, you're calling upon the ministry to provide information, that's great. And I want to make it clearly known that that also means responding to people who ask. We're trying to avoid all the hysteria that's going on out there by getting facts. And facts don't just mean something you sit down in an office and concoct answer people's questions and then you find that some of that crapola disappears thanks a lot mr Brzezinski. okay have a good day so now you understand 
why you should not miss Thursday mornings here on Grenada Broadcast. This man's with us every Thursday morning, Alan, and there is never, ever a dull moment when he's around. But not only on Thursdays. On Wednesdays, we have Sharon Roberts. On Tuesdays, we have uh, Ray Roberts. And on Fridays, Mr. Brian Pitt with his pit stop. And in just a wee bit, you're going to hear last Friday's edition with uh, Mr. Brian Pitt. That too. Informative and entertaining. But first. convenience services from Grenada Cooperative Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Welcome home. Conveniently located in the Grand Anne Shopping Center, for over 40 years, Food Fair has provided quality service at affordable prices. Now, grocery shopping is made easier and more convenient from the Food Fair web store. Hey, babe. Hey. Listen, uh, I need you to go down to Food Fair to get some groceries. Alright, no problem. Right away. Thanks, babe. What are you doing? You're supposed to be going to Food Fair to get groceries, man. I am. But didn't you know you can order your groceries online from the Food Fair web store? Are you serious? Of course. All you have to do is just log on to www.foodfair.gd with credit card in hand. And with an order of $100 or more, Food Fair Granite should deliver up to three miles away. And you don't even have to worry about your information, you know. Their safety measures are excellent. So hold on. You just order online and Food Fair will deliver to you? Yep. Maybe we better hurry up and order, man. I already did. This should be here any minute now. Enjoy easy online shopping anytime from your home or office from the Food Fair web store. Food Fair, where you can fill your baskets without emptying your pockets. Alrighty, folks, there he is, Mr. Brian Pitt. Would you please join me in saying very good morning to Mr. Pitt? How are you, sir? I am great, George. Are uh, you hearing me? Yes, sir. I'm hearing you. I'm seeing you. And I mean, we're all ecstatic having you with us. Things going well? It's been a few weeks. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, these things do happen. Not I all my fault. Pardon me? Not all my fault. No, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> I think everybody in the audience knows it was my fault. But anyhow, I think, keep our pinkies crossed. Let's hope that's behind us. So, BP, what's up your sleeve this morning, sir? Why don't I let you lead the conversation, George? 
Let you um, lead the conversation, George. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I think a good place to start is uh, with this stumbling block for the uh, uh, pertaining to the registry. It seems like another stumbling block in Grenada's legal system. You've been following all the stuff that's been going. I see you shaking your head. You've been following all the stuff that's been going on. George, I, I want to congratulate Lisa on her approach um, since she became president of the bar. Yeah. Feisty, eh? And I want to, I want to take us back to Ivan. Ivan was two thousand and four, right? Yeah. Sixteen years ago. The courthouse was destroyed, and that building has been a derelict building since then. It took long before people started to complain of being ill. Because if I'm not mistaken, the registry is right next door. Yeah. And there have been all kinds of things happening in that derelict bin that used to be courthouse. Right, John? Yes, sir. And it tells me that these governments have not been interested in justice, which means they have not been interested in the people of Grenada. No. Getting justice. Hey, over. Bear, George. No. Hey, George. Did you watch a thing? And, you know, Sorry, I believe that the did Grenada Bar Association has gone through several presidents. Yes, I did. In those and? 16 years. Yes, I did. Well, the audio And if I'm not mistaken, Lisa's voice has been the loudest in this regard. I, I, I think what hap I think what might have yes, happened there is yes, a combination sir. of the noise that uh, was on you the know, file. And it affects all of us. Plus the, uh -huh. plus the noise on the, the system. The trade movement, who I believe have acted okay. before the court. Okay. Uh, and the yeah, Chamber of Industry and Commerce and its members, who I believe have matters before the court. Listen, the reason why I'm calling you, Beth, Maybe the hoteliers and uh, every organization. Yesterday, um, Franklin sent me an email. They have matters before the court. And uh, I read and it, but before I was able to respond to it, it disappeared off no my computer, as do and several the other emails disappear off my computer. Do you have a phone number? When last have you been to the registry, George? I don't think I've been there in about 10 years, sir. You know, it is a, it is a sight to, to go into the registry downstairs, the registry, and look at the condition of some of the records that are kept there and people doing searches from books that are missing pages and edges and I really don't know how we can record or how we can recall who owns property in Grenada by being, being a proper search. So the registry has been in chaos for years. Brian, stick a pin there for a minute. Stick a pin. You talked about records. I don't know if you recall, uh, a couple of months ago, um, there was some talk about cleaning up York House. Remember that? Yep. Okay. Well... And I think they did. Yes. Well, to some extent, because mm -hmm. I took my camera and went down there to videotape the post cleanup work and there was still a lot of junk in there a lot of junk including Brian I went into a room and there was a library of books and out of curiosity and when I say books I'm not talking about printed books I'm talking about books in which you keep records okay out of curiosity I decided let me take a look and see what's in these books. Brian, apparently those books were records of court proceedings. You know, what the judge said and what the client said and, and all this kind of stuff. That's and good. I thought, how far back is this dated? 
Do you know that stuff went back to prior to uh, Hurricane Ivan, Brian? And I'm asking, these are obviously court records. Why are they still sitting there exactly where they were when this hurricane hit in 2004, what, that's 15 years ago? Huh? 16. There you go. Ain't that a shame? And those, I imagine, George, were transcripts yes. of trial. Yes. Yes. And so any, that, anybody could have just walked in, picked up, and walked out. Hey, big deal. So, and I think more importantly, George, is that people are now getting sick. And, 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 and it, you know, we don't know the extent of these illnesses and who might be responsible for these people getting sick. There's a matter of no insurance, there's a matter of medicals, there, there are all kinds of financial issues that some of the members of staff of the registry might have to undergo as a result of the conditions and the environment that they have to work, work in, George. You know, not too long ago, in the Ministry of Labor, I don't know if you know this of the general public that, they had to relocate the ministry, the, the ministry of Labor for a few weeks or months so that they can tear the carpet up from that ministry because it was causing people to get ill. I also understand, George, that in the Ministry of Education, people have been falling sick because of the environment and conditions of work. Now, I take it that these employees have been reporting these conditions to the trade union and that the trade unions are now in touch or have been in touch with the powers that be. We've said enough, George, on this issue. I hope that Lisa Taylor can get some action. But I don't think that the halls of justice, which is about maybe 10 years down the road, can solve the immediate problem. These people need a place to work and proper kept records in order that they can do their work. Brian, you said, okay, you were suggesting it's time to move on, but I want to throw a curveball at you before we move on. You suggested a little while ago that this negligence of uh, the legal system in this country is hurting the Grenadian people. And Lisa mentioned it's hurting the attorneys as well. But let me ask you this, Brian. You know, some time ago, a couple of years back, there was a lot of concern about Grenada becoming a one-party state and I have to ask you you know we talk about the ne you, you neglect the legal system um, then you're setting yourself up for like absolute control huh? I'm asking you sir if you see that as being a possibility one-party system no legal system to protect the constituents. Could I'm not saying it is, but I'm asking. Could this be part of the strategy, sir? George, I hope not to. We all hope not. Um yes, I, I hope not. And I, I, I hope it is just an oversight, but but everything is pointing us in the direction of purpose neglect. And if the neglect is done on purpose, then they're going down the alley that you're talking about. And this reminds me, George, of an old saying, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Could we be at the stage now where there is absolute corruption of power in Grenada? Now, if I won 15 seats three times, I might very well believe that I own Grenada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That's the scary part. That's the scary part. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you know, George, and it it it, it brings something to mind. I heard yourself and uh, Alan Brzezinski talking about the Scotland, the the Commonwealth Secretary General. Um, that we are now endorsing for a second term. And it is funny that she got into trouble, George, because of procurement. In other words, she gave contracts to people who she knew, whether it be family or friends. You know, we are at the stage in Grenada right now, George, where procurement is part of the instrument of governance so that we are procuring to our friends and family. And that is a regional problem. Maybe that is why Prime Minister Gonzalez felt that he can endorse Ms. Cochran because he doesn't see anything wrong with the instrument of procurement being used by government. Because nobody in the region, if I'm, mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, has been held to account for this procurement that is now an instrument of government. And you see, Brian, that's where we differ from places like the United Kingdom. It looks like this lady could be held accountable, in fact. If I'm not mistaken, a couple of countries have already withdrawn their support for uh, the Commonwealth. So people like her get held to account. And Grenada? Well, as I say, in the Caribbean, we don't see that as a crime. Maybe that's because nobody has been sent to jail. Yeah. That's a point I'm trying to make. No accountability. Mm. That's a scary position for us to be in, sir. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes. All right. So you've been monitoring Ms. Scotland. Uh, don't <laughs> be careful. Don't put your hand on her shoulder when uh, you meet her, okay? No, I th I, I, my, hand, my hand wouldn't get to her shoulder. She's taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, Brian, Brian, Brian. Oh, hold on. Just let me check social media here. Um, Margaret Francis says, time to digitize those court and registry documents. Uh, Brian says, good morning. Uh, with all those good news. You call that good news? Um, there's a comment here from somebody, just going back a little bit, Dexter Miller says, with a long list of cases against the government that's before the court, it's not surprising why this is happening. We should be mindful that we lost a lot of documents in a treasury before. Do you remember that, sir? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This gentleman may have a point here, Judge. <laughs> well... That's why I like sitting in this chair, man. I hear stuff I could never think about in a lifetime. All right, let's move on now. Uh, Brian, I know you saw an email I sent to you this morning about uh, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. They are having a sort of consultation next week. And this thing has been, I think uh, Alan was the first person to draw this to my attention. They sent out some documents for, uh, for, for, for comments. And uh, Alan pointed out that one of the things in that uh, proposed legislation, and let me, let me quote it for you. With, and this has to do with the network license granted to Grenlick under Section 14 and 67 of the Electricity Act 2016. Termination of license for expiration of its term. Transfer of shares of Grenlick to the government. Now, I've underlined this, I've highlighted this in red. When the term of this license expires in accordance with Part 11C2, the property of all shares of Grenlick held by private persons 
shall be irrevocably transferred to the government of Grenada free of charge and without payment for such transfer. Brian, we've already gone off the deep end, haven't we? Lawyers must be lining up, George, to get a piece of this. Yeah. After that law is passed. Now I note that the meeting in St. George is on the third of March. Yeah. And you'll be at there. 5 30. I will be there. Because because is government telling me that the shares that I own I should hand it to them? Free and they would not compensate and they would not compensate me for those shares. So so what is this? A dictatorship? No. But, but 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 even further, George, we go back to this absolute power corrupts absolutely and that some of these guys may feel that they are uh, that they own this country yeah. now i don't know where that came from i suspect that this is a last resort to get the pound of flesh by some people who used to work for Greenland. No, but George, you know, for those of us who study the Merchant of Venice. Yes, George? Go ahead. For those of us who study the Merchant of Venice, I think the judge in that in that Shakespeare play, play told Shylock, you can have the pound of flesh that you want closest to the heart without shedding an ounce of blood. You know what that meant, George? George? Tell me. That Shylock, Shylock did not get his, his bare Jew what he thought he would, because he could not take an ounce of flesh closest to the heart without shedding an ounce of blood. I, you know, I would like the government of Grenada and the enablers of this piece of legislation to take note that they have already lost two rounds, I believe, with Greenland, and they might very well lose a third, and the people of Grenada are the ones who will end up paying you. So if we all want to sit back on our haunches and let our, our representatives take us down a path where we will probably lose another legal case and have to pay taxes to pay Greenland. God help us. Well, I don't know where that is there. going, George. Pardon me? I really don't know where they're going with this one. Brian, you know, uh, if we're not yet there, I'm not sure uh, how far we are from it. All right, partner, listen, uh, before we run out of time, uh, and by the way, if you still have some, if, if you get one of your hot flashes and something comes up that you want to share with us, just jump right in, right? But uh, I'm going to continue on my stream of hot flashes here. There's been a lot of talk about the coronavirus. I mean, I'm just getting uh, kind of sick of it now. I'm getting the virus from hearing about the virus. And, you know, yesterday Alan and I were talking about the fact that, boy, there are so many opinions out there and conflicting conflicting opinions from people whom you would think would know better. I mean, the President of the United States uh, seems to be in disagreement with the, the CDC. The President, as far as I know, is not a medical uh, practitioner or of any sort. The CDC says one thing, he says something else. And it's not just in the United States. It's happening in Canada. It's happening all over the world. I'm sure you've seen a lot about the virus. What, sir, is your assessment of the potential of this virus right now? I have two concerns, George. My, my first concern is when you give a sample in Grenada to get tested, I believe that sample is not sent to either Trinidad or Barbados. And if I'm not mistaken, it would probably take them a week to 10 days to get the result okay. of that test. Hold, 
Oh, it's my understanding that uh, the results are to be available the same day. The issue oh, here okay. is, now, and this is the way I heard a doctor explain this, the issue is the trans uh, transmittal uh, or transmission of the information back to the people here in Grenada. I mean, come on. That baffles me. You, Ever heard of something you called You mean there's no secure? There's no secure way of transport of, of, of communicating that? You see, John, let me get to this next point. Because this was an opportunity, I believe, for us to work through CARICOM, you know. That CARICOM, the secretary, the secretariat, could have taken the lead as far as this virus is concerned, whether it be testing, communicating results, getting resources to, up, up, to upgrade and update our medical facilities, all that could have been done through CARICOM. This was an opportunity, George, for CARICOM to take a lead on behalf of the region. And I think they have the professionals there to do it. Unfortunately, most of these ministries of health may find it politically convenient for them to take control of something they know nothing about. Are you with me, George? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that is my major concern. It's like the President of the United States talking his nonsense when he knows absolutely nothing about the transmission of this virus. That is my biggest headache right now. That that we have not we have not commissioned the CARICOM Secretariat to take control of this whole issue. Even even it means bringing our our, our students back from China. Because they're they're they are, they are Caribbean students in China, right? Yeah. So so what are these individual governments trying to do? And and in their attempt to take control of this issue, I believe they're putting us all at risk. Okay. That, that's how I feel about this virus, George. And, and as I listen to the news every day from what can be considered reliable sources. This thing is getting worse. Not listening to some of the experts here. I mean, come on, chill. What's all the hysteria about? Come on. Well, well, those are people who are concerned about the fall in the stock market. That 1% of people who are very wealthy, concerned about how much money they might lose. They're not concerned about our health. I want to share a couple of comments here with you. Again, uh, digressing a little bit, but uh, we're running out of time. T.F. Richard says, but Brian, was in Scotland the same lady who was embroiled with a fake dignitary some years ago? Do <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Then, uh, um, Margaret Francis says, not to, not to discount Scotland's actions, but the Brits are only reaping what they sowed in this case. They used deception to get her in, and now they're reaping the benefits. Sadly, the Caribbean allowed themselves to get caught in the trap. Um, TF says, I remember her in a picture with the PM and a guy who was later known as Fake. <laughs> and had no accolades as he was claiming. Dexter Miller says, we all have to be careful in this. We all have to be careful. If this is passed, soon they will have the power to take all our savings in the banks. This person is talking about Grenlick and the uh, PURC. Um, Sharon Elizabeth Roberts says, not an ounce of blood, Brian. Shylock would not take a drop of Antonio's blood. <laughs> <laughs> you literature you. fanatics. You <laughs> went right over my head. Shakespeare and who is this guy? Antonio, etc. Richard St. Bernard says, more people have been killed by the flu than this virus. What say you to that, Brian? That apparently is true, and and, and um, the latest the latest um, communication is saying that this virus is just another flu that's going to be around for a while. Yeah. 
Well, apparently, you know, I was telling uh, Alan yesterday that I saw one of these uh, televangelists on <laughs> television this week. Uh, they had this massive sale going on where they were selling packages um, to prepare people for six months without food. For $3,000, you can get a package which will give you uh, so much to eat and drink water for six months and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, he, I'm serious he, about he, that. I'm he, serious about that. You know, just let me grab he he probably has a supermarket. Yeah. Pardon me? He probably has a supermarket. Yeah, man. Uh, TF is asking, is anyone aware as to if other Caribbean countries have students in China? And if so, what's being done? Uh, TF, the answer to that question, I'm sure other uh, yes. other places oh, have yes. uh, students there. Okay, Brian, listen, unless you have something one, else. One, yeah, one quick note before I leave, George. Yeah. Carnival. <laughs> And how yes. people dress. Yes. Very topical issue, George. Yes. And you know, for a few years now, we have not paid attention to how people dress to go on the rum runner on a Sunday. I challenge anybody, George, to take a walk on the car and ask where the rum runner is going out and any given Sunday. And they will understand how our young people dress the party at carnival. You know, I was talking to a young person not too long ago, George, and learned of a new phrase. The phrase is neo feminist. Do you know what's a neo feminist, George? No, tell me. A neo feminist is a woman who is very proud of her body and believes that she can wear whatever she wants to wear because her body is her own. It doesn't matter what size she is. She is proud of her body. I suggest that those people who are talking about the nude wear at Carnival need to have a conversation with some of our young people instead of just saying, hey, stop doing it. Let's find out why, and what's, let's find out what's in the back of their minds. Are they inviting the opposite sex to participate, or are they just expressing themselves? So That's all I have. Sir, I've been uh, <laughs> trying to pull up an email here. Ray Roberts sent me a uh, a picture of a very scantily clad young lady and uh, a comment that went along with that picture. Um, all you want to look... No, hold on a second. Things have really gone overboard in Trinidad this year for Carnival. I like my fun, but women are making a mockery of the whole thing with their nudity. Look at this poor girl, just too much. Instead of a turn on, she is a turn off. I guess next year to join a band, you will just have to take off all your clothes and hold up a placard to say what you are depicting, laughing out loud. And he goes on to say, what has happened to the law of indecent exposure? When some man with rum in his head pull her in the bush and fix her, she is still entitled to scream rape. The law is making an ass of itself. She looked for that. No sympathy. That's the text of an email that uh, came in overnight. So somebody out there agrees with what you're saying. You know, these people are luring men and uh, I'm not defending men in any way, shape, or form. You got some guys out there who should live under a cold shower, I'll tell you. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, George, 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 are they luring men or are they comfortable in their skin? You know, we, we have to be careful um, how we judge what people wear and how they wear it. Brian, 
I don't think anybody likes admiring a beautiful woman as much as I do, okay? This thing has gone beyond just showing your body. I, have you seen the maybe videos George, that have been circulating out there, Brian? Yes, yes, yes. But 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 take take note of this. Maybe in the coming years, those women who overexpose themselves might not find a husband. Might not find what? A husband. Yeah. Well. Well, at least one who's going to dedicate himself to, to her for a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, T.F. Richard says, Brian, we grew up admiring persons on a Sunday morning with their wonderful clothing. Guess it continues in a different way. <laughs> uh, I got to go, Brian. In those, go. Yeah. Okay. Take care, George. Have a good weekend. You too, sir. And uh, we'll see you next week. So long. Uh, Okay, Mr. Brian Pitt, there he goes. All right, all right, all right. Folks, it's been a tough morning. Interesting morning, but tough, informative, educational, so therefore we accomplished a lot. But I also know, and will be the first to admit, that it was a very annoying morning with all of the hassles we had with our audio. Got some good guests here this morning. We do appreciate them as well as your presence there in the audience. But it must have been a living hell for you guys to have to sit and listen to that audio. And uh, from what I gather, it's gonna continue until such time as we get our hands on a new computer, okay? So, this is where we're going to pull the curtain down, with thanks. Uh, parting word, I'm not going to read anything from uh, the scripture for you this morning. I'm just going to take it off the top of my head. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. But in everything that you do, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. I hope that's sufficient for you. Some of you probably need as much encouragement as I do. But things are going to work out. Things are going to work out. On that note, I say, uh, God bless you. And by his grace, Let's get together again tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock and every weekday morning for uh, Good Day Grenada. That too is an interesting program. Just in case you've been missing it, we'll see you then. God bless you.